What's up, everybody? Welcome to History Things with Pat. Special Zoom quarantine stay-at-home history edition. Uh, we are using the wonders of video chat today uh, to keep the history lessons coming to you in the crazy and historic times that we are living through. Uh, I live in the state of Maryland. We are still under a stay-at-home advisory. My guest today, Avery Lentz, lives in Maryland, so he's under the same stay-at-home advisory. So we have a strong Zoom history chat lesson for you today. Uh, but before we get into that, Avery, my man, how the hell are you, bud? I'm pretty good, brother. How how are you, how are you doing in all this, man? No, it's like, really the same as you. I'm ready to get out of this friggin' house. I'm I, climbing you know, the walls. I gotta yeah, you know, I'm I've, uh, I've enjoyed hanging out with the wife and kids, but I'm I'm ready to get out and like see people, go to a restaurant, sit down at a bar, and have a. I'm ready to have a beer with I, you. Yeah, man. I'm I'm ready to go. Forever. Yeah, I, <laughs> not to sound like a alcoholic or anything, but I'm just ready to get back in the bar. <laughs> hey, uh, what we're here to do today is to talk about an 1864 fight. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of these battles that uh, is one of the more unsung battles in the American Civil War. It gets overlooked practically every time you know we start talking about uh the civil war in a casual way because when it's held up to some of the bigger bigger and sexier battles like the battle of gettysburg or antietam fredericksburg things like that uh or chancellorsville considering we're recording this on may 2nd 2020 so like we're right in the middle of the chancellorsville timeline um uh you know it's one of the battles that kind of just gets lost in the shuffle because it's also the kickoff of a very uh bloody and violent and grueling campaign uh, that ends up setting up the siege uh, around Petersburg, um, you know, starting the inevitable end of the war, so to speak. And so, uh, Avery, we're here today to talk about uh, not just one of your favorite battles, but correct me if I'm wrong, we're here to talk about your favorite battle of the American Civil War today. My favorite battle of the entire American Civil War. That is correct. So we're here to talk about <laughs> the wilderness, the battle of the wilderness. Named, the wilderness! Yes, name the wilderness. Uh, it's the area of Spotsylvania in Orange County, Virginia. Uh, about, uh, I'd say, 70 square miles of forest. It was all second growth forest too. A lot of the trees that were used to fuel iron, one of which is Catherine Furnace. It's part of the Chancellorsville battlefield. Uh, if you go there today, Spotswood Furnace is another one. But these kind of second growth trees, uh, what I mean by that is they're very skinny. They're very young because there's so much timbering going on to feed the furnaces. A lot of the growth in the vegetation is very young, which means it's very close to the ground. Uh, there's a lot of underbrush. There's a lot of brambles and briars. Uh, and it's almost like a, if you go there today and if you, uh, go to the Chancellorsville Battlefield Visitor Center, where they do cover Chancellorsville, the wilderness and Spotsylvania Courthouse, um, there is a patch of woods next to the visitor center that was grown on purpose to kind of give people a perspective of what the vegetation looks like. It looks like a bamboo forest. Like it, it's, it's, it's incredible. And I want you to imagine fighting through that type of terrain over ridges and hills, creeks kind of spliced in there, little splotches of open ground every so hundred yards. Uh, but for the most part, it's all dense forest. There is a reason why Civil War armies don't fight in a lot of heavily wooded areas. It's, you know, we'll get into that as we go here. But, uh, you know, if you go there, you'll get a better perspective. And unfortunately, there's a lot of development there. So a lot of these battlefields are right smack uh, up against housing developments. Some housing developments are right in the middle of the battlefields. Um, so uh, preservation is very important for these battlefields, but particularly yeah, for the, the wilderness. Uh... The, the whole Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Spotsylvania <clears throat> wilderness area is really, really built up. Yeah. Um, and I made it out to Fredericksburg um, for the first time uh, in a really long time this past winter. And, you know, you just kind of forget that, you know, it's, it's really disappearing. And, and it does make you think about the importance of preservation. So uh, it's a good point to bring up. Um, 1864 is a pivotal time. You know, Absolutely. in the American Civil War, it's probably the most like critical year of the war itself. I don't mm -hmm. think many historians will really debate that anymore um, between the politics and the military momentum on the ground. Um, so uh, why don't you take our listeners through a little bit of a backstory and how we get to the beginning of May of 1864? Sure. Because, um, you know, it's great has only come into this army a few months ago. He's just come into the Eastern Theater, what is it, at the mm -hmm. end of beginning or end of March somewhere? So, yeah, so Ulysses S. Grant, uh, if you know that name, not just for the $50 bill, he is going to be probably <laughs> one of the most, the, not probably, he is the most successful Union general of the entire American Civil War. Um, and yes, that means more than William T. Sherman, but because Sherman's acting on Grant's, um, on his orders for most of the time. But the thing about Grant is that 
Um, he is known pretty much nothing but success, really, out in the Western theater. I mean, look at what he's got under his belt. Uh, you have Fort Donelson and Henry in February of 1862. Then you have the Battle of Shiloh, a very bloody but still Union victory in April of 1862. Fast forward, you have Vicksburg all through the spring and early summer of 1863, Chattanooga in the fall of 1863. Uh, and not only does Grant demonstrate his calmness on the battlefield, and even under fire for most of this, uh, for most of these fights, but he demonstrates his ability to adapt to different changes, not just in uh, circumstances on the battlefield, but in command structure and what he needs to do and all the responsibilities he has, because he goes from just being a normal army commander, a guy who commands like five divisions, to commanding three different armies or three different forces. Uh, for example, at Chattanooga, he's you know commanding George Thomas's Army of the Cumberland. He's commanding Rock. William Sherman's Army of the T Tennessee. Uh, he's also commanding Joseph Hooker's detachment from the Army of the Potomac, which made up of the 11th and 12th Corps. Um, and you know he's demonstrating his ability to lead at a larger standpoint. And by the time we get to the end of 1863, uh, the North. It's, it's bounced back. Um, you know, there was a couple of dark days at the beginning of 63, but by the end of the year, you got three major Union victories under their belt. You have Gettysburg, of course, being the most famous, but you also have the more important victory at Vicksburg, which cuts the Confederacy in half uh, on the Mississippi River. And then later that fall, of course, Chattanooga, which opens the doors to the Atlanta campaign, what will be the Atlanta campaign. And uh, by the end of the year, Robert E. Lee and George Meade you know, me being the commander of the Union Army of the Potomac, he never is out of command. He, me will stay in command of this army till the end of the war. And right. what's incredible here is that Meade and Lee, uh, their armies are still putting themselves back together uh, after the bloodletting at Gettysburg. By the fall of 1863, these two armies had come to a rest uh, near an area with that they were very familiar with. Uh, Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia, they're going to be dug in uh, south of the Rapidan River. Uh, near a tributary of that river known as Mine Run. George Meade tries to take a run at it uh, in the fall of 1863. Uh, he does cross the Rapidan River in the same area that they will be crossing in the spring of 64, uh, but he opts not to attack the Confederate defenses around Mine Run due to their formidability. And of course, I, I, I say without a doubt, I'm sure everyone was thinking about Fredericksburg, the previous winter. No one wants a repeat of that in the fall of 1863. So Meade's going to hold off attacking Lee. Instead, they're going to withdraw back north of the Rapidan River. They're going to dig in around Culpeper County Courthouse, and uh, Lee digs in around Orange County Courthouse, and both those armies go into winter camps. Um, a lot of things are going to happen for these armies. Uh, specifically for the Union Army, they're going to restructure. If you are familiar with the Union Army of the Potomac, before 1864, they had seven core systems, multiple cores, and generally these individual core were smaller than, say, a Confederate core because of how they structured it. Well, uh, War Department says no more of that. We need to restructure these armies to kind of match uh, Robert E. Lee's format, at the very least out, make our units outnumber theirs so we can avoid situations like we saw at Gettysburg, like we saw at Chancellorsville, and et cetera. So the Union Army of the Potomac is going to reconfigure itself. You're going to have the Union Second Corps, under Winfield Scott Hancock, they're going to absorb the remnants of the Union Third Corps uh, that was so badly de just destroyed almost at Gettysburg. Um, and I mean, not to say they were all wiped out, just to say they took such horrendous casualties, they've really been sure. picking themselves back up yet. Yeah, but makes them rather ineffective. Yeah. Yeah, so the second corps is going to absorb the third corps. So now you're going to be seeing guys like David Bell Burney, a, a prominent third corps division commander, fighting alongside guys like uh, Francis Barlow, who commanded a division at the 11th Corps at Gettysburg. Now he's commanding the 2nd Corps, all this kind of stuff. Uh, the Union 5th Corps is going to go to Governor K. Warren. He was the chief of engineers at Gettysburg. He uh, earns a Medal of Honor for his quick, stout defense of Little Round Top on July 2nd and kind of uh, demonstrates his ability to lead a core sized band of, uh, of people because uh, in October at the Battle of Bristow Station, while Hancock was recovering from the wounds he sustained at Gettysburg, Governor Warren was actually leading the Union Second Corps. So he shows George Meade that he can command a corps of troops, uh, keep them organized, and do so in battle. So as a reward for all his good leadership, uh, Governor Warren's going to get command of the Union Fifth Corps here. And the Fifth Corps is going to absorb the Union First Corps, which also, like the Third Corps, took a huge bloodletting at Gettysburg, so much so that they just sort of like absorb into them. Uh, and then you're left with the Union Sixth Corps. That's under John Sedgwick. And John Sedgwick, 
uh, has the largest body of troops in the entire Union Army, has had for the better part of the year, uh, and they don't really change much. Uh, also, the Union Cavalry Corps is going to reorganize and everything else. So you have all this, this metamorphosis going on. Yeah, uh, a lot of winter. flux in the Union Army right yep, now. A lot, of, a lot of flux in 1863 to 64. <laughs> Confederacy is doing the same thing. As you're aware of, Pat, James Longstreet, he was out west for a while. Right. Uh, you know, fighting at Chickamauga, of course, being the most prominent area that he fights, but also uh, suffers a pretty uh, stinging defeat at Fort Sanders outside Knoxville, Tennessee in November of 1863. Um, so he's going to stay out west until about, uh, you know, about, I would think it was about March or April, he starts to send his troops back in piecemeal units. Um, and they're still going to be arriving. So for most of the winter, it was just the Union Second Corps under Richard Ewell and the Union Third Corps under A.P. A. Hill. Uh, excuse me, the Confederate Third Corps. Uh, uh, those, con you know, those pesky Confederates. Uh, but yeah, those <laughs> those two corps. That's what Lincoln all, said for about four years. <laughs> pesky Confederates, yeah, yeah, but yeah, those two corps are uh, all that Lee has really, and of course Jeb Stuart's cavalry. But uh, nevertheless, these armies, like I've said, have been really licking their wounds. Still, they've been taking the fall. They've had a lot of minor battles, but not a lot of major. Uh, upscale fights like we saw at Gettysburg. They have not had a fight like that um, in about, by the time we get to spring of 1864, almost a year. Uh, it's right. been almost 10 months since Gettysburg, and these armies are kind of itching to get back at it. Um, there are a couple of differences we need to be made aware of. Uh, for the Union Army, the Potomac, they're going to be bringing in a fresh batch of people. They're going to be emptying out the Union garrisons in Washington, D.C. They're also taking a bunch of draftees. Uh, right. There's going to be about 30,000 of these fresh troops put into the ranks and they're intermingled. They're not fresh units. They're intermingled. In they're intermingled. In 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 <laughs> yeah, and this is one of my favorite times because yeah. anybody that knows me knows I love heavy artillery units. Yeah. And yeah. this is when the heavies hit the field. This is when they, this is when mm -hmm. they put on the infantry leathers and, and, and get themselves out on campaigns. And I yeah. love it. You know, yeah. No more guns, but, but, no more. No well, more forts, no more fatigue duties. It's time to march and fight. There, there are, some of these units are also bringing their heavy artillery out into the field. You're going to have that rolling with the Army of the Potomac, some of these massive howitzers that the Union had. Uh, you know, these siege guns that haven't been used or fired almost the entire war are now being put into the field with their units. Um, right. And so that's something I like to bring up, is that the Union Army is getting a fresh batch of soldiers. The Confederacy, not so much. Manpower shortages is starting to show. Robert E. Lee knows this. All the supplies that they grabbed during the Pennsylvania campaign in the summer of 63, it got them through the winter, but man, by the, su by the spring of 64, those supplies are almost gone. Yeah, they're like and, and, and things are getting, and Robert E. Lee knows things are getting pretty scarce. Men are without proper footwear, have been for months, uh, bad clothing. Uh, it's been, you know, a really rough winter with disease. A lot of malaria went through, uh, a lot of yellow fever. This and Terry, of course, number one killer of the war has been ripping through both camps. I mean, it's just, it, these guys are primed for a new campaign, but there's going to be a huge difference coming into the spring of this new year of 1864. And the most important thing I would say that you have to remember about this year is that it's an election year. It's the first time the United States of America is going to hold a presidential election during wartime. The first time that a seasoned uh that a president is uh, a sitting president i couldn't season president sitting president he was seasoned by then uh, <laughs> he's yeah, very uh yeah. was it paprika I'm smelling paprika a little, and, little basil uh, <laughs> yeah a little bit of basil and some balinese yeah uh but yeah uh president lincoln's gonna be the first president to seek re-election during wartime and that's a big deal that's a huge right. deal and there's going to be a lot riding on this election. That pretty much sets the stage for all of the fighting that's going to happen in 1864. Basically, this election is being decided on the battlefield. And so now the Confederacy has this new goal is basically, okay, we've lost Vicksburg. We've lost Chattanooga. We're, we're not doing hot. We're not going to win this offensively. We can't. We simply can't. We don't have the manpower. We don't have the time. We don't have the resources. So what we need to do is just survive. Because on the other side of things in the North, there is a growing anti-war sentiment being fueled by Northern Copperheads, these anti-war advocates, uh, yeah. also uh, Northern Democrats who had sympathies towards the Confederacies, uh, uh, you know, to their plight and everything. And so because of that, you, <laughs> you're having kind of Lincoln between a rock and a hard place. Sure. Uh, because now he's facing a, almost like a, an uprising in his back door 
uh, but all through the political machine. The Democrats, uh, they're basically saying, okay, this war, 62, 63, it was so bloody. There was no end in sight. We've come no closer to victory. Uh, and, and he's prolonging, he being President Lincoln, is prolonging this conflict just to benefit African-American Negroes. And that's not what this war is about. And that's the right. words of the Democrats there in the, in the year of 1864. So unfortunately for this country's history, I know we like to stand on a pedestal sometimes, but a lot of people are in agreement. They're not saying that right. this war is worth it uh, because of that. So um, there, Lincoln, there's a real fear that he will not be reelected. And Instead, a Democrat will be elected in his place. And rumors by spring of 64, it had not been confirmed yet. It doesn't get confirmed until August of 1864. But there are rumors that the Democrats are going to run George B. McClellan as uh, the Democratic the nominee nemesis. for president. The nemesis. nemesis. Yeah, McClellan is back in the picture. And he's running for pres this time, or not yet, but he basically, there, there was no doubt his political career was way more important. <laughs> oh, this uh, guy's had political aspirations uh -huh, long, uh -huh. and maybe even long before the War of the Rebellion even breaks Probably. out. <laughs> yeah, back when he was just running railroads and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, um, he was a man that liked to run shit, you know? Yeah, so, I mean, imagine your President Lincoln hearing these rumors in the spring, early spring, late winter of 1864. You got all these campaigns uh, that's, you know, that are going to be hinged on or that this, excuse me, this election that's hinging on the success or defeats of these campaigns. Uh, currently, at the time, General Grant is brought east. The Red River campaign is going on uh, out in Arkansas and Louisiana. And that's not going well at all. That's under Nathaniel Banks. It's a abysmal failure. Um, oh, yeah. And, um, <laughs> yeah, things aren't going well. But that also, that's, that's, that's been some confusion in the past. Everyone thought Banks' Red River campaign was part of Grant's overall plan. It is not. It was put in place before Grant came east. But why is Grant coming east? Well, Grant's pretty much the one solid rock here for the north. Uh, by the late winter, early spring of 1864, General Grant's a freaking rock star. His I mean, resume is looking his good. His resume is very good. He's the victor of Vicksburg. He's a victor of Chattanooga. Probably one of my favorite uh, depictions of history, if I could just be a fly on the wall, is when Grant and his son Frederick uh, arrive, or has he just affectionately called Fred? Fred, Fred Grant. Uh, when Ulysses and Fred arrive uh, in D.C. and they get to the hotel they're staying at, I can't remember the name of the hotel, uh, they're, they're, there's a standing Is it the Willard? Station. It's the Willard, I think. Yeah, you're right. So I went down and did a little, little uh, COVID, yeah. you know, exploration <laughs> today in a few places. And yeah. one of the places I ended up was right out front of the Willard accidentally. And I was like, kind of like, oh, oh, damn. Like, you know, this is kind of like everybody that's anybody that's anybody stayed here. Battling Pretty much. the Republic. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm pretty sure McClellan was there at one point, but definitely this is where Grant and Fred came, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, so Grant and Fred, they get a standing ovation uh, from the guests there in the dining room and in the lobbies of this hotel. Uh, it becomes very big news when Grant arrives at the Capitol, and there's no, I mean, it's probably one of my favorite situations. So Grant is arriving to receive a promotion uh, on February 10th, 1864. Uh, the U.S. Senate, they authorized the commission of lieutenant general to be reinstated. Uh, and Grant is the person they pick. He, so, yes. He's the first one since He's the George first Washington. since George Washington. Now, everyone's right. like, but wait, Winfield Scott. I'm like, well, Winfield Scott was a brevet lieutenant general. So right. he retires as a major general. He was a right. brevet lieutenant general. Grant gets fully instated Outright. to lieutenant general. And this can't be emphasized enough. This is a guy who started the war as a captain in 1861 and True. has risen through the ranks so quickly he went through the brevet system and everything That's and then finally do. yeah right <laughs> and here he is in the spring, in the spring of 64 the beginning of the spring of 1864 and he is now the highest ranking union general in the entire country and what's even better is that his old boss and rival and nemesis henry halleck who has done nothing but stick his fist in grant's crawl through spreading rumors that he was drunk or whatever, yeah. and then trying to buddy up to Grant, telling him that he was had his best interests at heart. I mean, really, yeah, I had your back, bro, the whole time. It was always you and me, you and me. Sociopathic behavior, <laughs> incredibly sociopathic behavior. Uh, what's great is Grant is arriving to become his boss. Uh, Halleck becomes very much more of a of a pencil pusher because Lincoln he knows he's full of crap at this point. So he's like, let's give General Halleck the job that he's good at. Which this is, is a uh, this is a Dick Winters Dick Winters Captain Sobel moment. 
Oh, yes. Yes, it, it is. This war, is a, war, war effort needs you elsewhere. <laughs> this is a, yeah, but like on the biggest, on the top level, you're not just like yep. mid-tier officers. Um, you're this would be like, boss. yeah, this would be like, um, oh man, let me think. It would be like if, if you had like George Marshall in, in, <laughs> in the, if he was being replaced by Eisenhower by FDR himself. Right. Uh, and basically we're like, George, you still have your rank, but you're going to only be doing paperwork. Uh, Eisenhower's going to be over you and yeah. you report to him. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's how crazy this is. Um, <laughs> and what the, it's great about it is how it's like, Oh yeah, yeah, I can do that. No problem. And he, and he suckers up to Grant, but Grant, um, they all had, I know, right. <laughs> they all had this idea uh, that Grant was going to stay in an office in DC and run the war. Uh, Cause Grant is of the agreement with a lot of the other high members of the union war department. Uh, we need to run on a multiple front kind of campaign here. All armies have to move at once. We can't have any downtime because if the Confederates see that we are giving them downtime, they're going to shift forces from one end to the other. They've been doing this for years. We can't let them do that anymore. Right. We have to put Enough. pressure. We got to put pressure on all points. So Grant decides to issue orders once he gets this rank uh, at the beginning of March of 1864. He's going to tell Benjamin Butler and the Union Army of the James, a very brand spanking new Union mm -hmm. Army, uh, it's going to start moving up from Yorktown, moving past Williamsburg. They're going to start to move towards Richmond, following in the footsteps of what George McClellan did in 1862. At the same time, you have Franz Siegel in the Union War Department out in the Shenandoah Valley, moving out from Harper's Ferry, moving out from Winchester, Virginia, moving up against, or I guess moving up, yeah, the Shenandoah Valley, going south. It's so no, you're, yeah, if you're going yeah, south. You're, you're, you're going south, you're going up. If, if you're, you're going, going north, you're going like down. This, you're going up. Yeah. <laughs> it's so Down. confusing. Yeah, so anyway, they're going up the valley uh, <laughs> against John Breckinridge and his Confederate forces there. Um, at the same time, and in, in, in Pat's going to love it, William Tecumseh Sherman in the Department, oh, of, the, the Department of the Trans-Mississippi is going to be, or uh, not Trans-Mississippi, I think they're the Appalachia, it's the, uh, one or the other, uh, the military division of the Correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not. I don't, I don't know the, actually know the answer to this question now that you're saying it out loud. Right? What's the name of that department? It's like basically everything between the Appalachians and the Mississippi River. <laughs> Pat, help! <laughs> Sherman's Command Department. I'm sure it's, the, it's the military division of of the Mississippi. Of the Mississippi. military <laughs> division of the M I S S I S S I P P I. Yes, correct. So that force that's got about two different armies there. And they're going to be moving south against Atlanta, the railroad hub, the logistical hub, the, 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 the nucleus of Southern Confederacy at Atlanta. That is the main target here. So all of these armies, you know, that's a total Sherman, Siegel, Butler, and George Meade in the Army of the Potomac are all going to be moving at once against various objectives. And their objectives, Patrick, they're very different. There's no more on to Richmond talk. Now... Right. We're going to be targeting the armies themselves, the ability for the Confederacy to wage war. We're going to be targeting their armies in the field, and we're going to try to destroy them. Well, or so that's least always how I like to, that's always, let me, I'm sorry yeah. if I interrupt you, but that's always, sure. this is a good moment to illustrate uh, how I kind of like to illustrate this to the casual observer of the Civil War. This is how, to me, this is how I see the moment. This is the moment the Union war effort decides to stop playing chess, and they decide to, to fight a friggin' war. Oh, it gets real. It gets real, like, real fast. There's no mm -hmm. more – honor Richmond is great because that's a chess, you know, symbolism. We're, yeah. You know, we're shifting. We're positioning. There's this – we're going to capture your capital and capture <laughs> the flag. And, like, right now, yeah. Grant's basically showing up with going, like, look, everybody's just now out to destroy mm -hmm. the ability of our enemy to wage war. So now this is an actual war. It's always yeah. been a war, but for the Union war effort, their focus yeah. is now actually war. Let me put it to you this way, Pat, and you can agree with me or disagree, it's fine, but I always put this for visitors that would come down to the battlefield at the wilderness uh, and do tours. I'm like, think of the spring of 1864. Think of the start of the Overland Campaign. Think of this battle as the D-Day of the Civil War. Right. The fighting that begins here, the fighting that begins at this moment is going to continue all the way to the end of the war. The same kind of fighting that you see begin at D-Day lasts all the way to the end of the World War II, or at least to the German surrender. Sure. And so that is what I like to put in prospect here. This is a fresh Union force comprised of veterans, draftees, and new recruits 
And now they're going to be launching, stepping off on a campaign that has never been seen before, the likes of which have never been seen before, and just how much movement is going to occur here. The mindset you have to go into is as, as people now in 2020, don't look at the Overland campaign for successes in singular battles. Think of the Overland campaign as that massive drive through France. We have to keep moving, no matter what roadblocks we hit, no matter what. So there's going to be a lot of things I address as we get into this. The, the idea that Grant is a butcher, that he's a drunkard, that he's not as creative as Lee, that Lee's better. That could not be further from the truth. People who say that do not understand this campaign, plain and simple. I'm not trying to offend anyone, but this is a much more complicated it's situation. It's, 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 it's just, just a, a fact. fact. It's, it's a much more complicated situation than anyone gives a credit for. The Overland campaign has always been one of my favorite areas of study because it's probably one of the most misunderstood campaigns of the war and also one of the most important. The fighting that occurs here on both armies, particularly in the Union Army, is going to dictate the rest of the war. The fighting that starts at the wilderness will get us to Petersburg. If we can get to Petersburg, I'm telling you, it was over. In my humble opinion, it was over. As soon as Lee boxes himself in at Petersburg, it's a matter of time. Grant knew it, Lee knew it, and I know it. And that's something that, for a long time, the war history, the war historians of the Civil War, they could never give Grant that credit. They always wanted to leave you hanging in suspense. That, oh, I don't know. Lee could have pulled something out. I'm like, well, maybe some other general, uh, you know, elsewhere could have pulled something out. And, I mean, but really the, the Confederates' main goal here is to stay alive and to turn the North against the Union war effort so that Lincoln loses that election, McClellan gets reelected, the, Confe the Northern Democrats then would sue for peace, they'd let the Confederacy be, all those slaves that had been emancipated by the Emancipation Proclamation would have to have been returned to their masters and, the war, and everything would have just kept going. The Union would have just accepted a defeat to end the fighting. And that's only going to get worse as we go through this summer of 1864. But all of it begins at the wilderness. This campaign is going to kick off at the same time. All these campaigns kick off at the same time. Um, but it should be noted, and what I love talking about, is that Grant's decision here uh, is what throws everyone for a curve. He's going to decide not to stay at an office in D.C. He is right. going to ride out and join the main Union Army, which of course is the Army of the Potomac, and he is going to continue to stay with them and call the shots with them while also instructing other armies. That's another thing we have to remember. Grant is not taking command of the Union Army of the Potomac from Meade. He's not taking command of any army. He got all of the army. They all answer to Grant. Grant is telling Sherman what to do while he's telling Meade what to do. Put why, that in why need one army, baby, when you can have all of them? When you have like all of them, about 10 Union armies total in the whole war, 1864, and they're all moving at once. And I'm like, that's an incredible job to have. While also in 1864, without cell phones, radios, or any kind of really standard communication. And uh, also, imagine doing that while you're trying to face down probably the biggest threat to the Union, which is Robert E. Lee himself and a Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, that's the biggest target. That's why he's going to ride with me. He's like, we got to defeat Lee. Lee's been a problem child here in the Eastern Theater. For some reason, these Union generals over here could never get a handle of them until at least George Meade at Gettysburg. And some would argue McClellan at Antietam. I know they're out there. I, I'll, I'll even give some, but we're not talking about Antietam. I uh, mean, Buster Douglas beat Mike Tyson. You know, it happens. <laughs> but, yeah, um, <laughs> that's, that's great. I love that. Uh, but, yeah, Grant is going to ride uh, to Meade's headquarters on March 10, 1864 at Culpeper. When Grant gets there, Meade thinks he's being relieved of command. He even tells Grant, he's like, this is a fine army. They will serve you well. I just ask that, you know, you basically give me a good recommendation or accommodations or whatever. And Grant's like, oh, no, no, sir. You're I going think nowhere. Of, I know. He's <laughs> like, you, I could think of no better person to command this army than you. You're the one who led them to victory at Gettysburg. And so I'm like, man, that's another fly on the wall moment I wish I could have. Is the minute that Grant starts buttering up old snapping turtle mead. And the thing is, there was a lot of tension before Grant arrives there. Uh, there's a lot of animosity within their staffs. Grant's staff doesn't think much of the Army of the Potomac, thinks they're all a bunch of pansies. Oh, these, these guys have lost. They had defeats. I mean, they he's kind of <laughs> warranted is, in this. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. I'm like, Pat McGuire, if Pat McGuire was a Union staff officer on Grant's staff, that would fit so perfectly. Yeah. Because like, I would imagine you being like, listen, we've been kicking butt out west. Right. Why can't you guys do the same here 
What's I'd going be like, on? Just, now, just yeah. don't run away. <laughs> just, now, just stop losing. <laughs> obviously, armies are larger over in the Eastern Theater. Makes it a lot sure. harder to command. Very different also, war. Very politics, reality. Politics. 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 Uh, yeah. Both DC and Richmond being so close. So yeah, I mean, there's sure. a lot of factors here, and in vice versa, the Army of the Potomac, they're like uh, this Grant guy. I mean, see stuff. Well, we also had a Westerner command this army at one point. His name was John Pope. He didn't do so hot. Grant's never met old Granny Lee or old Uncle Lee or whatever. Now, here's the crazy thing, and I think Grant makes a great point of this later on. The Army of the Potomac, their issue has always been holding Lee to higher regard than any general that ever commanded them. Everyone was like, oh, well, Lee, he's a god around here. And I'm like, when you're – like, it's like the rules of basketball. When you think the other team is – uh, otherworldly you're probably going to lose to them because already they've won a few games and now they got in your head they're all up in your space son and so that's kind of the state that the army of the potomac was in for a while but now we have gettysburg on their docket and grant is hoping to ride that momentum that psychological victory that this army got at gettysburg he's like okay you guys i know you can fight i know you're not losers i know you won at gettysburg show me the same thing here just and do that this, yeah, again. Yeah, do that again. And so George Meade is getting told orders by Grant uh, that, you know, where Lee goes, you will go also. He is your objective. We're not going to Richmond. We're going to attack Lee. Now, here's where things get really important, somewhat nitty-gritty, and I'll, I promise it's the worst it'll get. The Union Army of the Potomac is going to have to find a way to get Lee to come closer to them. Grant does not want to advance west. He does not want to go west towards the Shenandoah Mountains. That's right. going to put distance between him and his basic supplies along the Potomac River near D.C. He wants to stay closer to the bay, wants to stay closer to the Potomac, wants to make sure that his supply bases can stay intact because he remembers what happens when you leave your supply base right. strung out like that. Yeah. Confederate cavalry, especially in Virginia, dominates the field. That's about to change as well because Grant's going to bring in a few additional – uh, additional changes to Meade's army. And this is the best part. Uh, the biggest one is going to be a whole other corps. It's the Union Ninth Corps. That is commanded by Ambrose Everett Burnside. Woo -woo! And, why, and why does that name sound familiar, Pat? <laughs> uh, Antietam and, um, I don't know, maybe another battle we've had you on uh, my... Uh, Fredericksburg! Fredericksburg, that's right. Uh, <laughs> that was, uh, yeah, we had you, uh, you, you came on mine and Matt Border's podcast mm -hmm. to talk about that. That was an awesome time. Uh, yeah, thank I you. I had a good time. battle, uh, and then I, you know when we were done recording, I realized I knew absolutely nothing about that battle, <laughs> and uh, and I was super pumped to have learned all that. So uh, make sure you check out the History Things podcast. Avery's uh, episode is like technically our third episode on or on the page, but it's like episode two as far as our huge one. So yeah, uh, yeah. Burnside uh, is the guy. He's the yeah. guy in Fredericksburg now, during that he, campaign. Yeah, and Burnside's back again uh, almost a year and a half later. And what's crazy about Burnside is that his men, the Ninth Union Corps, that was always kind of his guys, they got a victory at Fort Sanders. They're the ones who gave Longstreet his defeat outside Knoxville, Tennessee, in November of 1863. So Burnside in that campaign got acquainted with Grant. Grant says, hey, you have familiarity with this army. I'm going to be a stranger. I would feel much more comfortable if you came with me and brought your Ninth Corps, too. They've also fought with the same army before. Also... You guys have demonstrated to me that you're not terrible. You can actually fight. You can wage a pretty good <laughs> campaign. So come on over. Also, one of their divisions, commanded by Edward Ferrero, is probably one of my favorite division commanders for the Army. Uh, well, it gets sticky here in a minute. Um, um, one of my favorite Union Division commanders here. Edward Ferrero's division <laughs> <laughs> for is For those of you who don't know Avery, Avery is like a walking encyclopedia of orders of battles. And he can get into the absolute wickedy weeds with you. Yeah, I can in get terms into, of like I could get I could get into the wilderness. Uh, uh, yes, yes, yep. you can. And we're going to in, in about a minute here. Uh, but yeah, so sorry to interrupt you, but I just felt people need to understand that yeah, like, if no, you see so Avery, wanna, yeah, if you see him censoring himself, it's merely because there is a nerd tiger in that cage that he's just <laughs> he's, trying to he's hold in. Yeah, he's he's always fighting. He's always. He's always trying to Tiger King me, you know what I'm saying? The only anyway. reason we hold that in, because we <laughs> encourage letting your nerd tiger out of the cage, but the yeah, only reason yeah. 
The only reason that we uh, we even attempt to hold it in here is because all of our episodes or our contributions to the page would be like six to eight hours long, and we just can't Lord of the it. Rings, Lord of the Rings style. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> but um, but yes. Anyway, the point I want to make about Ferrero's unit, his division in the Ninth Corps, they are comprised of United States colored troops. These are African American soldiers for the first time in the war. Will be fighting at least under, near, or in the proximity of the Army of the Potomac, and that's a very interesting. Um, developments because a lot of the army of the potomac soldiers uh, many of them are still very bigoted many of them do not believe this war should be about the emancipation of negroes but now they're going to have the first ability or first chance to see blacks in uniform and eventually they're going to have a chance to see them fight but that's not going to be the case here at the wilderness they're going to be pretty much on reserve for most of this two-day battle now uh another addition oh sorry one quick note about the ninth corps is that because technically General Burnside outranks George Meade. Burnside will answer directly to Grant. He will not answer to Meade. So what you now have are two different chain of commands. You have anyone in the Ninth Corps going directly to Grant, anyone in the Army of the Potomac, that's the Second, Third, and Sixth Corps, going directly to Meade, then then goes directly to Grant. Does that sound confusing? Because it was. <laughs> yeah, I was saying, uh, yeah. Obvious. So, yeah. So if that sounds like it's a mess, it, it absolutely was. And they're eventually going to fix that. Grant's going to get the, the, the bureaucracy moving to promote Meade over Burnside. And by the time you get down to North Anna, Burnside will be put under the command of uh, the Army of the Potomac. But not yet. Uh, and that's going to contribute to some of this confusing mess that's about to happen. Um, that's also going to bring uh, to light some of the issues that Grant and Meade's command structure are going to have. Grant is not here to try to show Meade how to do his job. He's not here to supersede him and make him look like a child in the midst of a war zone. But at the same time, Grant, he's not, he doesn't know the Army of the Potomac. He's not familiar with them yet. He's going to get very frustrated with how they run things. And that's going to cause a lot of friction, particularly between the staffs of George Meade and Ulysses S. Grant. But yeah. nevertheless, Grant and Meade respected the hell out of each other. Grant did everything in his power to make sure that Meade got all the recognition that he deserved and anything that like fell apart, Grant took responsibility for. If it was, he's like, that's not Meade's fault, it's fine. And that's something that's very much important. You have to understand Grant's character. He's a really good guy. Yeah, and he that's, is. Yes, he's a great guy. And like the thing is, uh, Meade's not used to it. So Meade also gives him his respect as well. Uh, but one last thing and something that Meade doesn't like as much as Grant's new pick. For the, for the Union Cavalry Corps Command. And that is Philip Sheridan. All right. five, six of them. <laughs> He's a short guy. Yes. Um, hey, man, don't knock dudes who are five, <laughs> six. You know, I'm just saying. Actually, you know, he might be shorter than that. Don't worry about it. Point is, Sheridan's short. But he's got... <laughs> I might be shorter than that? No, or Sheridan. Phil Sheridan. Sheridan. Phil Sheridan. Uh, Sheridan. Oh, bro, that's a dagger. I know, I know. <laughs> Sheridan is also a Western general who was an infantry division commander out there. He led a division. His forces actually took Missionary Ridge at Chattanooga. And Sheridan has got probably an even more fiery temper than George Meade. Uh, those two getting at it, which they will come to blows multiple times during this campaign, uh, is something I wish I could have seen because, man, the profanity. The anger, that vein pulsating on your temple. I can imagine that George Meade and Phil Sheridan just, man, two guys who could not have hated each other more. But Sheridan, I'm going to make a case for, there's a lot of pros and cons to his appointment. He's going to take the Union Cavalry Corps, a unit that has not been very aggressive, that usually at the beginning of the war let the Confederates ride literal circles around them, now has a very fiery, aggressive commander. He's going to use these guys more like infantry than for recon. There are problems with that, for sure. But Sheridan is saying, hey, guess what our target is, guys? Jeb Stewart, the Confederate Cavalry. I'm tired of these guys riding circles around us, getting their names in the papers, and causing nothing but a bit of fuss. So, basically, <laughs> I had to get it in there. Had to get it in there. Anyway, the point is... It's almost a requisite on almost any program idea that you just get in, like, a groan-worthy, like, yeah. Gettysburg or guys <laughs> in general. So, I'm, like, Pretty proud much. of you for that. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, Sheridan's goal in the spring of 64 is to kill Jeb Stewart, basically. Um, so, that is going to cause... A fair goal. But, nevertheless, once we got all those things, so let's refresh. Got the Union 2nd, 5th, and 6th Corps. That's... Winfield Hancock, Governor Warren, John Sedgwick, all under George Meade. Got the Union Cavalry Corps under now Philip Sheridan, also under George Meade. That's going to cause friction later. And then you got the independent command of Ambrose Burnside's 9th Union Corps, 
that reports directly to Grant. All in all, you have about 120,000 men that begin to move out of Culpeper on May 1st, 1864. At the same time, Robert E. Lee is going to be able to see the movements of the Union Army. He's got a lookout, a signal station, um, and the name of the mountain completely escapes me. I should have done more research to this, but there is a mountain <laughs> uh, near Orange County that Lee has used as a signal station all winter, and Lee will now see that Grant is moving down towards the Rapidan River, moving to the east to cross at a place called Germana Ford. So the Union 5th and 6th Corps are going to cross there on the Rapidan River. The Union 2nd Corps is going to actually cross at Ely's Ford and move down through the old Chancellorsville battlefield to swing back around to go back west. And that was always an interesting account to see. These 2nd Corps Union soldiers marching over a battlefield they had fought over almost to the day a year prior. They're still finding skeletons. They're finding carcasses of horses. There's yeah. still burn damage on things. And what's great is there are many accounts of veterans training to the new recruits in the second corps saying, see that skeleton? See that pile of bones over there? That'll be you in a few days. So enjoy the next few moments of peace. And it's like, ooh, like that's, that's a very dismal lookout on things. But nevertheless, what is the first major success for Grant and Meade here is the fact that they can get across the Rapidan River without any, any obstacles at all. Grant makes magnificent progress with George Meade and the Army of the Potomac. Uh, we also, at the same time, all the Union armies are moving. They all started out on May 1st. Ron Siegel Clark moving Mountain, up. by the way. My yep. notes just popped up. It's Clark Mountain. When you look at May 1st, all the other Union armies are moving too. Franz Siegel's going up the Shenandoah Valley. Benjamin Butler going up the James Peninsula. These three massive Union forces are moving at the same time. And the biggest one, Meade just got across a pretty formidable obstacle, which is the Rapidan River. And wow. now they're neck into the wilderness. Now, the wilderness, as I said, it's 70 square miles of second-growth forest. There are not many roads through this area. But it's they are akin gonna be the... to Fangorn yeah. Forest for you Lord of the <laughs> Ring fans. Pretty much, if Fangorn Forest had more briars and brambles. Imagine trying and to fight a battle in Fangorn Forest. Well, you'd have more than just the enemy soldiers to worry about, wouldn't you? Ants, 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 ants. Ants, yeah. <laughs> tree bear. Tree, I am no tree. No tree. Yeah. Yes, We're but anyway, <laughs> I know. yeah, I know, right? But yeah, I mean, there are, there's only one major north-south road in the vicinity of this wilderness that can, tell, that can take you where you need to go. And that is the Brock Road. It runs directly from the Germana Plank Road, uh, Orange Turnpike intersection, cuts down through the wilderness going south, and the end destination before you get to another intersection, that next intersection uh, at the end of the Brock Road will be at Spotsylvania Courthouse, which is the center of Spotsylvania County, Virginia. That will be the setting of the next phase of this campaign, but we'll get there later on. The point is, here now, we have to get through the wilderness. And this is what I cannot emphasize enough. General Grant was not trying to fight a battle here. Neither was George Meade. The Army of the Potomac is supposed to get through this area as fast as possible. Union Cavalry has also covered a lot of ground. Half of them have gone back towards Fredericksburg, which was about 10 miles, or actually, no, even further, uh, 13 miles east to the east, uh, which is now becoming a Union medical and logistical hub. Uh, the Union right. have Fredericksburg. It's in their hands. Um, and so what you have now is Sheridan is going to be swinging around, and he's going to basically say, hey, I can't find any Confederates. Or we, uh, the path is clear. And uh, the fact that Grant Meade, they got across the Rapidan River so quickly, uh, it's great. They cover a lot of progress. By May 4th, 1864, Grant's walking on air. He's like, hey, this is a huge success. We were able to get across this river without any obstacles, without any resistance. We are now going further to Richmond. And, and uh, or, like reporters are saying, you're going to take Richmond. And Grant says, I propose I can reach it in about four days unless the enemy or Bobby Lee has anything else to say for it. Then I assume it'll take longer. And so at this time, the Confederates are coming back east as well. Um, but Lee's got his own issues to worry about. So um, like I said, Longstreet was absent for most of the winter. His Confederate First Corps, they have been coming back from the Shenandoah Valley area. They were near a place called Gordonsville which is southwest of Orange County Courthouse on May 4th. Uh, they get there by train. Uh, George Pickett's division will stay there. 
Charles Field and Joseph Kershaw's divisions will also continue. Should be noted, John Bell Hood has been promoted, also lost a leg. Lafayette McClaws is out of the Army. Uh, so um, the point is you got a couple new division commanders for the Confederates as well. So this battle is going to be a test of leadership for a lot of new commanders at a lot of different levels. That what is, is – tell our – real thing. quick, before we move on, tell, tell our, our listeners and viewers one of the reasons – uh, about Gordonsville that, that makes that position sort of beneficial for Longstreet. Um, go. I mean, I mean it, it's a, like I said, it's a railroad junction, but it's also a crossroad intersection. So there's a lot right. of roads that head back east that you would want to be on. The problem is, is that Jeb Stewart's got his hands full. The right. Confederate Calvary, like we had just talked about, <laughs> they got the Union Calvary to worry about now. Jeb Stewart's like, who the hell is this Sheridan guy? He is a psychopath. He will not leave me alone. And so Sheridan <laughs> and Stewart are going to pretty much be doing their own things, which means the wilderness is going to become very quickly an infantry v. infantry battle. Now, there are a few divisions of the Union Cavalry Corps that will still be with the main body of the Union Army as they move into the wilderness on May 4th. And that's going right. to be James H. Wilson's division of cavalry. And they are going to have the hard job of covering three different Western-aimed uh, roads. That's the Orange Turnpike, the Orange Plank Road, and the Catharpin Road to the south. Each of these roads, there's about two to three miles of forest between each of them. There's a couple of open lots here and there. And now I'm painting the battlefield, so try to bear with me. The sure. grounds around these roads, these three roads, these three westward roads, there's a lot of forest. They're on ridges. There's some runs and streams that run through them. There's a couple open lots like Saunders Field, like Tap Field. These fields that are going to have Basically, no major farm on them, but they're named for uh, the woodlots that they're there that some farmers rented them. There are also some farms in the area, like the Permelia Higgerson Farm, like right. the Tuning Farm, like the Elwood Plantation, which will be the headquarters of the Union Fifth Corps during this battle. And so uh, other than that, there are not any major towns in the vicinity. There are not any major resources or infrastructure. It is very much a wilderness. And so these roads are the only marker of civilization that these armies are going to have. Now, those western-facing roads, those westward roads, the Orange Turnpike, Orange Plank Road, Catharpin Road, Grant wanted cavalry posted in all three of those roads to basically stand lookout to see if Lee was going to be coming his way. The other two divisions of cavalry, that's David Gregg and Alfred Torbert, I got other jobs. They're not here in the vicinity. So what here's going on is the fact that on May 4th, Wilson is got James Wilson's cavalry, his Union cavalry force. They have a really tough job. They have to now cover three different roads. The idea was initially to use all three cavalry divisions. Now you got one cavalry division covering three roads. They're spread out, spread thin, and things are only going to get worse from here. Because even though Grant and Meade had such initial success with this movement, they moved so fast that they outpaced their wagons. That's why not all the Union Cavalry is here. Torbert's division is covering these wagons that are now strung out because the army itself outpaced these guys. And so Burnside's Ninth Corps, they're not even out of Culpeper yet. They're still taking their time getting into the fray here. They're basically a floating reserve. And so you got the Army of the Potomac, the Union Fifth Corps is completely camped around Elwood, the Orange Plank Road, uh, yeah, excuse me, the Orange Turnpike, Germana Plank Intersection, that's going to be kind of the nexus of the Union lines on the night of May 4th. The Union 6th Corps starts to cross the Germana Ford. Uh, they're going to be moving down the Germana Plank Road towards the Orange Turnpike. Union 2nd Corps around Chancellorsville, about four miles to the, to the east. They're going to start to move out in the morning of May 5th as well. Now, here's the thing. The Confederates are also going to be coming up pretty quickly, but they're spread out. You got Richard Ewell in the second Confederate Corps. They're going to be using the Orange Turnpike. Right. AP Hill in the Confederate Third Corps. They're going to be using the Orange Plank Road. James right. Longstreet is delayed. He's also going to get lost. So he's not going to be on time. He's going to be about a day behind where he initially wanted to be because of logistical issues, bad reconnaissance, and just the wrong turn, pretty much. Um, and the fact of the matter is, Robert E. Lee is going to issue orders very similar to his Gettysburg orders. Do not bring on a general engagement with the enemy until the army is concentrated. As Robert E. Lee knows that, yeah, Grant, you know, he 
he's this Western general, but, and he didn't, you know, he wasn't really phased much at first when he heard the news that Grant was taking over, but Longstreet, it's Longstreet, Grant's old best friend and former best man at his wedding who tells Lee, um, yeah, listen, Grant, I know him. He's going to fight us every day. Yeah, this guy's coming to play. Yeah, he's not, he's not here to mess around. He's a very capable commander. You need to take him seriously. Uh, and I think here's one thing. Lee and Grant going into this battle, and this is why Patrick McGuire, this is why this is my favorite battle. These two generals, titans in their own right, Robert E. Lee on one end, Ulysses S. Grant on the other. This is the match of the century. This is fight night. This is, this is Mayweather versus – Oh, I don't Pacquiao, know. Pacquiao, when it should have happened. Yeah, yeah. Mayweather versus Pacquiao. Not this like 80 a, years yeah. after when it finally happened and it was a shitty fight. Like, it's yeah, this yeah. Is what it should have happened. The point is, it's a boxing match. These two guys. And this is going to be the battle that they face each other for the first time on a battlefield. And they're going to be feeling each other out. There's going to be a lot of mistakes made on both of these men's part, but a lot of really good cuts on both of their parts as well. And they're going to have a much better understanding after this battle and an understanding that can be developed on and add and added to um that can be um progressed as well i think is what i'm trying to say but the point is is that these armies are going to be closing within very close distance of each other by the by the night of may 4th unfortunately the union uh is not aware of it but like i said their goal yeah. is to get through the wilderness as fast as possible as They're fact, not a couple to fight things a on that here. matter it's the yeah. brush is so thick that not only are they unaware of their proximity, but like it's also going to lead to bad intelligence. And that's something that Meade has to deal with a lot uh, in the days leading up to the Battle of the Wilderness. And at one yeah. point, he gets these, I guess, reports coming in that Jeb Stewart's hanging out around Fredericksburg. And it causes him to like shift a bunch he of send, resources. He, he sends Greg's Cavalry Division over there. So Greg's Cavalry Division heads to Fredericksburg. Torberts is covering the wagons. That's why Wilson's his. The only so guy the bulk here. of the army is essentially blind for a moment here. For a um, moment, yeah. Yeah, so, now, you know, and all that's going on. And the other thing that I think is important before we, like, really yeah. dive in, because, like, we're pretty close to getting into the actual fighting here on May 5th. Yeah. So, I think it's really important to understand that, like, Lee understands this heavyweight fight that's coming to him now because of, obviously, he's been able to see a lot of Grant and the Union Army's movements. He's been getting way better intelligence than, than you know, me and, and everyone's been getting at the time. Mm -hmm. He's also aware of his logistical situation, manpower, resources, and all that stuff. He's also aware of the battlefield they're playing on, not only because they fought there so many times, but because it's the home field for them in the sense, yep. right? Like they've held a very strong tactical advantage here, um, doing things when up against superior forces like they are now. So, you know, if yeah. you peel back the clock a year, you know, we were talking about that a minute ago, or more than a minute ago, because we are yeah. dirty deep divers. Yeah. 63 at this time, right? You know, they're essentially in the same position. They're, oh, they're out uh, numbered. Uh, they're up against a, a big force that's kind of yeah. on the move. And they that's are there. So, so what does Lee do? Lee picks his battlefield again. Mm -hmm. And he does this because it's going to make moving artillery a friggin' nightmare. Uh, it's going to just make moving anything a nightmare. And then because things are so congested and crappy in there imagine getting into a a civil war style infantry fight you know where we're in the transition really from line infantry styles into more of these smaller tactical objective style fighting units except yeah. now we're like you know 50 60 70 80 90 20 we you know like even like smaller very kind close of, quarter very close quarter in there. yeah and lee knows yeah. that he's got the guys better suited to handle that because of their experience. So I think it's really important to stress the fact that, like, when we go into the fighting on May 5th, Lee has picked this battlefield. Like, this is – and, it, mm -hmm. and, and, and so, you know, regardless of how this story is going to flow, you just got to remember that Lee picked – he didn't. Nobody wanted this fight. Lee didn't want this fight, but he knew that once he was going to get it, he's like, this is where we're doing it. Yeah. What's up, everyone? I'm Pat, co-host of the History Things podcast, a new history podcast covering a wide variety of subjects across both U.S. and world history. Join co-host Matt Borders and I along with special guests as we take you through some of history's oh, most man. famous stories. The History Things podcast can be found by searching the History Things podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, and by asking your Amazon Alexa app. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at History Things with Pat and at Matt Borders Book. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. I 
and welcome back. So what we are doing now is we're picking up where we left off, and we were talking about how Robert E. Lee is sort of picking the ground of his choosing. You know, he's aware of the, the sort of state of things around yeah. him, the disparaging, you know, differences in his numbers and, and things like that. So he's he's picking this thick, nasty underbrush to fight it because of the chaos it's just going to cause which, logistically which, for moving. Which is great that you point that out because there's uh, another misconception about this battle that um, that we have had about the Overland campaign and the Petersburg campaign as a whole. So that Lee's only goal here is to fight defensively, which makes him a better fighter than Grant because he fights defensively, he just lets Grant smash his head against the wall here. That's not the case at all at the Wilderness. Otherwise, why would Lee be moving up in here? Lee knows the best chance he has to stop Grant is to bottle him up right. in a place where his numbers won't count for anything. And that is this Wilderness. So Lee's gonna be acting very aggressively. Also, Lee's doing exactly what Grant wants because now Grant has him coming to him, coming east away from the Shenandoah, away from Orange County. We're now moving closer towards Fredericksburg. So that's closer to Grant's supply hub. Grant doesn't have to overextend himself. But also, more importantly than anything, uh, like I said, this is going to be a battle where both Lee and Grant um, are going to have objectives and they're going to have goals, and we'll see what happens at the end. And here, Pat, I'm going to make a very controversial uh, opinion. And <laughs> you statement. being yeah, controversial? Man. I would say, and you can make your own judgments at the end of this, that the Battle of the Wilderness is not only a tactical draw, but a strategic union victory, as we will discuss. But I would say, given the tactical objectives of the Union Army during this battle, it is a decisive union victory. And this is why. Now, I'm going to take, make this point, and I'm going to keep going, and we'll readdress it at the end here. What is the Union's main goal at the Wilderness is to move south along the Brock Road. Keep that road open. You're going to hear me mention it, but the Orange Plank Road, the westward road, that middle westward road, it intersects with the Brock Road at the Orange Plank Brock Road intersection. That intersection is the, the most important site on the entire wilderness battlefield. Both armies know this. So that is why the fighting around that intersection is the most intense. It is the most horrific. It is the most heavily contested. That intersection is incredibly important. For the Union, they need to keep that intersection open so they can go south. They need to keep the Confederates off that road. The Confederates, if they want to stop that Union advance south, they have to take that intersection and put it uh, in defensive areas there. So with that in mind, we're going to go into this battle. We come up on May 5th, 1864. The Union Army is still sitting idle because they have to wait for their wagons to catch up. James Wilson's Union Cavalry Division, they are now spliced between three different roads, Orange Turnpike, Orange Plank Road, Catharpin Road, furthest to the south. There's about two to three miles of woods that separate each of these three westward, westward roads, but they all intersect with the Brock Road, which is our main Union objective here. And so with that in mind, Wilson is going to have contact with Confederate Cavalry on the morning of May 5th down along the Catharpin Road at a house, uh, at a site called Craig's Meeting House. Uh, Thomas A. Rosser's Virginia Cavalry Brigade is gonna start tussling with some of Wilson's regiments. So Wilson is gonna divert a bunch of his troopers down to the Catharpin Road to reinforce his guys around Craig's Meeting House. They're gonna make their base of operations at a place called Todd's Tavern, where the Catharpin Road intersects with the Brock Road. And so that area is going to be heavily cavalry related we're not going to get too much into that but you have to understand that's where most of the union and confederate cavalry are going to be at, at the time of this battle they're fighting along the catharpin road south of the battlefield at the wilderness now this because he's doing this wilson is going to leave only one cavalry regiment for the whole union army of the potomac the fifth new york cavalry they are the only ones left in the vicinity of the main body of the Union Army. They're gonna be stationed along the Orange Plank Road. He leaves zero, zero Union Cavalry regiments on the Orange Turnpike. And so, what that means is, Ewell and the 2nd Confederate Corps on the morning of May 5th are gonna start approaching up the Orange Turnpike. They're gonna be approaching east. They're gonna be heading towards Saunders Field, which is a nice 800 yard long, 400 yard wide plot of land. It's an old cornfield. There's old dry cornfield stalks there. And on the east side of the field, 
You have the Union Fifth Corps, Governor Warren's troops, coming in on the morning of May 5th. These Union Fifth Corps troops are going to see a column of dust rising over the Orange Turnpike heading towards them. They believe that it's probably the Union Cavalry. The Union Cavalry took off on their ride. It must be them out there. They would let us know if the enemy's out there. Well, around 8 a.m., the Union Fifth Corps skirmish lines are going to start to see gray-bodied troops moving in and out of the tree line on the other side of that field. It becomes very apparent that it's the enemy. 800 yards, Pat. Separate. Yeah, this is, this is point blank, guys. We are getting ready to do it. Yeah. And so now the Union Fifth Corps <laughs> is getting word back to General Warren, who gets word to General Meade, who gets word to General Grant, whose headquarters would have been around the Germana, Germana Ford itself uh, right. along the road, most of the May 5th. And so Grant is going to basically, without skipping a beat, when he hears the Confederates now are moving up in force towards their position, towards the Brock Road, towards their movement, towards their crossing areas, he decides the best defense is a good offense. Or That's at the right. Office in general. Well, good. Is, we'll leave that to be desired. The point is, <laughs> he turns to the courier. He tells Meade, he writes a message to Meade and basically says, General Meade, you will pitch into the enemy at the soon as possible opportunity, which means attack. Do not give them time to dig in. Do not give them time to get adjusted. Attack as, at, like, at once. This kind of aggression, very common at a place like Shiloh, very common at a place like Fort Donaldson, Vicksburg, Chattanooga, what have you. For the Army of the Potomac, that is a very unheard of kind of, oh, we usually have more time to prepare. And so now for the Union yeah, There's Fifth a Corps, pounce mentality yeah. going on right now. It's like if you see them, smother them. Yeah. Now Meade's all about it. He's like, F and A, let's go. You know, let's, yeah. let's go. So he tells Warren, you will pitch into the enemy as soon as possible opportunity. Well, Warren isn't quite ready yet. He's still filling out the ground. Warren's also, this is going to be his first major, major battle. Uh, like, you know, he fought at Bristow Station as a Corps commander. He was in the Mine Run campaign as a Corps commander. Doesn't do much. This is his first major battle commanding a Corps in this kind of situation. So he wants all his ducks in the row. Now, if you're Warren, and there's a case that can be made for Warren here, he doesn't want to attack through Saunders Field or the area around the Orange Turnpike until he has Union forces on his right. So he's got three regiments here, or three divisions, that are going to be leading this assault. In Saunders Field itself, it's going to be Charles Griffin's division. On his left, going south into the woods, is going to be James Wadsworth's division. And then on Wadsworth's left is going to be Samuel Crawford's Pennsylvania Reserve Division. And so, basically, these three divisions have three different targets. The Griffin... His division is going to be moving through Saunders Field. Wadsworth's division is moving towards the Higgerson Farm. And then the uh, Pennsylvania Reserve's Crawford's division is moving towards the Tuning Farm. And these are all little splotches of open spaces. So that's what they're using as a dictated site to approach towards. Problem is, there's nobody up on their right. Warren has another division in reserve, but he doesn't want to bring them up. That's John Robinson's division. He's going to hold them for most of the day, most of the battle, really. And that means Warren is waiting on the Union Sixth Corps under John Sedgwick to get up on the right. Now, the, the ground on the right flank of the Union line at the wilderness, all woods. There's no real accessible way in there except for one little plotch of, like a little cut through the woods. It's called the Spotswood Road or the uh, Spotswood Furnace Road. And it kind of runs down at an acute angle uh, to the Orange Turnpike at some point. Now, you can move troops down that road, but imagine moving some 22,000 men. This is just how many men are in the Union Six Corps. Imagine moving all those guys uh, almost, you know, and actually I think, yeah, yeah, about 20 to 25,000 men. Move all those guys on a road that's literally 10 yards wide. <laughs> their wagons, their ammunition, their cannons, their men. That's going to take a while. But wait, and, but why couldn't Burnside just get across the bridge at Antietam really fast? <laughs> See what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Bottlenecks are uh, a very difficult obstacle to overcome. I mean, and, in this type of warfare, they are a, a very real thing where you have these large massed armies in the field. Like now our, our militaries operate in smaller units and they're not out there in these large formations of fighting another massed unit. So it's, <laughs> These very 
small tactical engagements, these huge yeah. things, sometimes they encounter very narrow passages. And yeah. everybody's just got to get in line. Yeah, it should be noted that, like I said, you know, I mean, the Potomac number is about 120,000 men. Lee has about 60,000. So it's about two to one odds here. But it's core v. core at this point. But we have to remember these core, the Union Corps are now larger than the Confederate Corps since that restructuring. And so Warren doesn't want to attack until Sedgwick puts troops on his right. Uh, Sedgwick's left, if that makes sense. And so that means Sedgwick has to get his men down this 20-yard, 10-yard wide road got to get them into position. They now have to find that right flank of the Union Fifth Corps. And then that's, you know, then they'll get the go ahead to go. So that's 8 a.m. when the Confederates first arrive. We get to 9 a.m., Cedric's still not in position. Get to 10 a.m. Yeah, because Warren's, Warren's absolutely right to be concerned. His guys are taking fire as they come up. You know, they're getting in for They're, they're not even attacking yet. They're not even attacking yet. They're just sitting they're on They're just the, coming up. On their side of the field, they're watching the Confederates on their side. The Confederates during the whole morning of May 5th around Saunders Field, they're digging in. Because right. you will remember, okay, we're not supposed to bring on an engagement, so we're not going to attack either. Yeah, they're digging earthworks. The yeah, shovel's they're around. Two core, they see each other, Saunders Field in the center, and they just stare at each other for most of the morning. So they're going to be, yes, the second Confederate Corps is going to be digging earthworks, these trenches. They're about four feet deep, another two feet on top, usually with trees, mud, uh, brambles, to kind of act like barbed wire. And these guys are going to be putting their muskets through uh, the branches. They're going to be resting it on top of the trenches there. The idea of breastworks is that they came up to the breast, but these are earthworks. These are trenches. They're only going to get more complex and more formidable the further south we go. And, I mean, it really is a precursor to what World War I will be, this new style of warfare, this trench warfare that you're going to see. Uh, but they're not – yeah, these are makeshift trenches. Guys are digging them with, with uh, any spade they can find and mostly their bayonets and their pots and their pans and their plates and whatnot. But, um, yeah, so that, they're getting time to fortify here in the morning. Finally, around noon, <laughs> uh, you know, Grant is not hearing any guns a-booming. And he <laughs> sends word to Meade saying, uh, I thought I told you to attack. What's going on? Like, why the delay? And Meade's like, uh, could you hold on for one second? I'm going to check. And he's like, Warren, you need to attack now. <laughs> And, and basically, Warren is like, well, is Cedric in, commit in place yet? And Meade's like, I have no way of knowing that. Cedric's all the way up on the Germana Plank Road. They're going right. down this little shit ass nowhere road. Let me and, ask my crystal ball what's going yeah, on right now. <laughs> yeah, so that's, there's, there's definitely the, 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 down, the downside of fighting here is, man, I don't know where anybody is. And you just better hope they're there. Um, so the problem is Warren doesn't want to lose his job doesn't want to lose his command he knows that uh he's seen it happen before men who were uh immobile in the moment and then they got replaced in the moment and his career aspirations could be gone so uh warren decides around 1 30 that regardless he's going to go for it so he rides up to charles griffin and tells him hey you're good to attack and griffin says okay somebody is the sixth corps on my right flank because griffin can't see up there in those woods to the north of saunders field he's just and, hoping that his support is yeah. there Yep, he's hoping his support is there. They're and, there, right? <laughs> yeah. Warren basically lies to Griffin and says they should be there. Yep, yep. Totes my goats. He's totally yep. there. <laughs> he's like, yeah, man, yeah, 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 they're up there. You go, uh, you go on ahead, though. Yeah, you just okay. do your thing. Yep, pretty much. <laughs> so the Confederate Second Corps has been unlimbering across the entire front. Uh, in, the, in the Saunders Field vicinity, it's Edward Johnson's division. Uh, these guys are the Culp's Hill veterans. Uh, and what's amazing is the Fifth Corps of – <laughs> the, these guys uh they are the little round top veterans you know they're these guys uh almost swapped here meeting once again the 20th maine is going to be making this assault with charles k griffin and uh griffin's attack is going to last from about 130 uh to um about 245 ish and um it's so it's a it's a very short assault uh they have initial success uh, they get across the field. They get shot at the whole time they're advancing. But as soon as they hit that west side of the Saunders Field area, they break through both sides of the road. So the Orange Turnpike cuts directly through the field. So you have, uh, you know, everybody on, this, on the south side of the Turnpike, they're breaking through in mass numbers. They, 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 they clobber J John, uh, John Jones's Virginia Brigade. Uh, and basically they roll up the, the entire left side of Johnson's division. Um, and then you also have Maryland Stewart's brigade getting breakthroughs on their lines. Now here's where things get muddled. 
Uh, Johnson not having any other Union troops to the to his left, the Union right, he basically says, okay, those guys are exposed out there in the field. Let's wheel out and just shoot into their flanks. So sure. now you have Confederates taking fire at the Union right flank in Saunders Field. Griffin immediately is like, the hell? You know, he's like, th th those are Confederates firing into my guys up there. Where is my support on my right flank? They're not there. Um, further south, things are not going well because uh, – Wadsworth's division that's attacking around the Higgerson farm was supposed to maintain contact with Griffin. That does not happen. The wilderness does not let that happen. The terrain, the topography, it splits these divisions up and Wadsworth basically makes a single attack against the Higgerson farm line while of course, Griffin's making a single attack against the Saunders field line. So, right. uh, and the same for Crawford, but Crawford's actually not meeting a lot of resistance down around the tuning farm. And he's going to stay there uh, for most of the afternoon. So what's crazy here is that back in Saunders Field, Griffin, who had had initial breakthrough, has no reinforcements coming up behind him. His division has, bro has broke through, but Warren does not send any more forces, especially once Warren sees that Griffin is drawing fire from the north side of the field, from the Confederates in the trees on that tree line. And so Griffin does not get the support he needs. Uh, a couple artillery units roll up into Saunders Field, and they just start lobbing canister rounds into the trees. Uh, they hit their own guys. Is this one of the units that will get captured a little later in the day, these artillery units that come up? Because I know that yeah, some of the Union gun, guns do. One particular gun is from the 1st New York Light Artillery, or the 5th New York Light Artillery, I think. And um, They're not they, able to move it, though, until the night comes. Nope. Yeah, and it's Confederates who bag it anyway. Um, That's what I mean. Yeah, the point is, is that they wheel these guns directly out in the middle of the field. They try to support this attack. And around the time they're doing so, the Union forces, even though they've had initial success here, they are getting uh, counterattacked hard because Johnson gets help from Robert Rhodes' division of Ewell's Corps. Rhodes' men barrel back into uh, Griffin's division, and they push them back through the field. Griffin's going to do a uh, fighting withdrawal. They're going to shoot, stop, fall back, shoot, stop, fall back, shoot, all the way back across the field and doing so. They have this artillery piece cover their withdrawal, but the Confederates advance out into the field. These men uh, start fighting hand-to-hand -hand over, this, over this weapon. At one point, a brawl will erupt between a Union and Confederate private. Uh, and these guys, literally the whole battle stops almost to watch these two dudes duke it out. Um, and I mean, it's, 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 you can't make this up. It's, yeah. it's, like these guys literally, like the shooting almost, they're still shooting going on. Uh, both you know both sides of the field uh but here's the thing everyone stops to watch these guys fight there's like um, a better part of several hundred men not killing each other for a few moments to watch like a fist of cuffs yeah pretty much um we are fight yeah that's how surreal the civil war can be um but now, this is the same fight where my beloved iron brigade falters for the first time in its history that's around the higgerson farm that's around that uh that attack they're gonna start to attack uh around uh, George Doles' Georgians. Oh, right, 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 right. And so they're not quite in Saundersfield, but they're literally just south of it. They're, they're in the woods just south of Saundersfield. That's right. Um, and, yeah, they, their attack does not go well. My ancestors unit, the Bucktails, the 149th PA, 143rd, 150th, 150, uh, 142nd, and 122nd, 121st, these, excuse me, uh, a lot of the Pennsylvania regiments, they, they also get bungled pretty hard around the Higgerson farm. But my ancestor was dead by then anyway, so uh, he's got no stake in the game. But nevertheless, these are his guys, his friends, his unit. Uh, they're, they're having a rough time on May 5th around the Higgerson farm. Um, and Pramelia Higgerson is a staunch pro-Confederate lady. She's a proud Virginian. Uh, apparently, Bucktails trampled her cabbage garden, and she said uh, there'll be hell to pay for that. And, of course, they get repulsed uh, by the same brigade of North Carolinians, Junius Daniels, that they had fought at at Gettysburg. And so as they are withdrawing back across her land, Cornelia Hickerson's taunting them as they go. And that is why I do not like Cornelia Hickerson. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, two things on that subject. One, obviously, there's no way that those guys got chewed up because they trampled the cabbage. And two, cabbage sucks anyway. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, just good for the bucktails for doing that, because, like, because sash or not, cabbage sucks. You shouldn't yeah. be growing that crap. I have wondered many times, because there's only <laughs> one account. I mean, the bucktails are the ones who say that they she was taunting them. Uh, but, I mean, who knows if it got misconstrued over time. There's so many of these romanticized stories that come out of the Civil War that you're like, did that really happen, though? Or <clears throat> Barbara Fritchie. Yep, lost, 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 pretty much. Read this. <laughs> You're like, the, you're like the entire lost cause. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. 
Um, but yeah, so we have here uh, of these, these attacks, this main, this first union assault, uh, it does not go well. Right. And uh, these guys do get repulsed, but they have initial success. That's the thing is they fight so ferociously, kind of like they did at Gettysburg. The Confederates are like, man, these guys still are deadly a year, almost a year later. And uh, I mean, we got, we, we put some licks into them ourselves here and we repulsed them, but damn, you know, and especially around the Saunders field area, because a lot of Confederate dead are accrued around that area. But nevertheless, Griffin falls back, Wadsworth falls back, Crawford's going to stay around the tuning farm. So the union line starts to resemble this disproportionate U uh, that's, or like an arrow almost, I would say, that's like jutting towards the Confederate line. Um, and what's crazy is <laughs> One of my favorites, uh, uh, kind of, it's, um, my goodness, what am I trying to say? Episode before, uh, Griffin is furious. Furious that basically Warren lied to him. And so Griffin is going to ride not to Elwood, where Warren's headquarters, not to his corps commander's headquarters, where he should have reported to. He rides to Meade's headquarters, which was literally in an open field right on the Orange Turnpike across from where Elwood Plantation was. Because Griffin and Meade, they had been buddies back in the Fifth Corps days. And so Griffin goes up to General Meade and just starts tearing into him about Warren. Not at Meade, he's just ranting to Meade. Uh, basically, and Grant at that point is arriving on the battlefield. He's been on the battlefield now for about a few minutes to like almost half an hour. And he sees Griffin and sees kind of this exchange going on. And according to Theodore Lyman, this is where I take this with a grain of salt because Theodore Lyman doesn't like Grant or his staff. Um, it's very evident in his writing. So it, just take it with a grain of salt. But Lyman, according to Lyman, uh, as Griffin's riding away back to assess the damage to his division, Grant walks over to General Meade and basically says, who is this General Greg guy? And why do you let him talk to you like that? You should have him reprimanded. And according to Lyman, this is some bullshit. Excuse my language. <laughs> Meade, I mean, let me see what you think of this, Pat. Me, according to Lyman, Meade turns to Grant without answering him, looks that his coat is unbuttoned, and he buttons his coat for him and says his name is Griffin, not Greg, and that's just his way of speaking. There is no way General Meade has the balls to do that. There's no way that is the case. Now, I can understand if Grant is like, all right, who is that guy? What's the zeal? And me being like, oh, that's just Griffin, and, you know, it's no big deal. Trying to cover for his friend. But why Lyman writes it is that Grant Meade's basically like, you're an idiot. You don't even know this army. Yeah. And calm down. And you need to stop being such a child. Pretty much like patronizing Grant. And I'm like, that's why I don't like Lyman. And for the same reason, I can't really trust Horace Porter, Grant Stafford, because Porter says some pretty unflattering things about Theodore Lyman and George Meade. So that's what I'm talking about. You have this disconnect with two different types of union staff here, and it's sure. creating issues. How but, that's why, but that's why Grant ultimately does something that I think is, is cool and yeah. integral to having success, whether it's on the battlefield or in business or mm -hmm. on a sports team is just understanding the common objective and, uh, and trusting people who have a track record of doing it or succeeding yep. to just get it done and not micromanaging. And so he literally, there's, there is uh, like, I, there are a multitude of written and official orders that are given yeah. and issued during this time and until the end of the war. But essentially there's only one order with one objective attached to it. The order is essentially wherever Lee goes, you go. Oh, yeah. And the objective is to fucking destroy him. Yeah. Like that's it. Yep. Yeah. We got to bleed him out. We have to and bleed him. And what, what Grant does, and as you're going to see, you know, a little bit here and as this campaign goes, is he's going to trust his subordinates to understand this mm -hmm. and get it done. Exactly. And that's why particular battles might be indecisive in one sense. But in reality, is it's not about... It's not about the, the, the war's not being won here. Or it's not being lost here at the wilderness. It's about this bottom line. And yeah. you can take X, Y, or Z hits so long as the bottom line remains the same kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and that's why these months of the war, May, June, and July, in combo with the other things going on, like we're Frederick guys, right? Uh, a yeah. few months after this in July of this time, 
Monocacy Junction is is raging, and and at the end of it, Jubal Early slinks back into Virginia. And this, we're really at the beginning of the long end of the Civil War. And, and people will make the argument that like, well, there's still a lot of fighting left. And it's like, cool. Well, World War One. I'll make the same analogy argument with you: is Operation Albright yep. is a tactical retreat. It makes the Germans hella strong for a little while. But also tell me that that's not the beginning of the end of the war, because from there on, it's just about kind of breaking that line down in yep. war of attrition style, making sure the Germans understood that the uh, allied forces, the on top plus the Americans now, um, could do this forever. And the, yep. the, the German, Austro Hungarian war machine couldn't. And so even though we, you know, we fight after these weeks and months, like, what do we do? We ended up in a situation in Petersburg, just like we ended up along the Hindenburg line. And, yep, yep. and at the end of it, it, it broke and it was over. So um, the, yeah. these are, this, this is an integral time in the war and we're dealing with complex stuff that has become so complex and convoluted that Grant's just going to boil it down to wherever Lee goes, you go. And the goal is to destroy him. Yep. And, and, and the people around him start to get it. And that's where we are now at the Wilderness. Exactly. Yeah, he would not have been successful. Lincoln would not have been reelected if the Army of the Potomac didn't understand those lessons and learn from them by the time we get down to the fall of 1864. Yeah, but here, no now. It's just, this yeah. is the plan. Go. This is a learning curve. And yeah, Grant has now seen his first taste of how the Army of the Potomac operates. The Fifth Corps assaults, they fail. They withdraw. Now, here's where things get fun, because this is where the lost cause of mentality would have you think Confederates basically dictate the whole battlefield. That it's just they fight defensively, the Union assaults them, and, and they are unsuccessful. That's not the case here, because now Ewell is going to counterattack. And that's generally what you do in this aftermath here. But around the ending of these, uh, these, 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 this fighting, around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the Sixth Corps finally arrives on the right, right. flank line. And what happens is Ewell is going to launch assaults, counterattacks, against the Sixth Corps. Now it's the, it's the Confederates' turn to attack. It's the Confederates' turn to blunder. They're going to run into the same problems that the Union forces had, the exact same problems. Moving so now we're north of the turnpike now, we're, right? we're north. We're north of Saunders Field. We're in the thick woods right. north of Saunders Field. They are now attacking the Sixth Corps up in these woods. They are going to run into a lot of problems, they being Johnson's division of Ewell's Corps. Stafford's Louisianians, uh, the Stonewall Brigade, they're going to be making these assaults, and both of these assaults occur between 3 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and yeah. they fail. They it's fail. only about an hour of fighting. Stafford is mortally wounded, gets shot through his spine. The Louisianians and Virginians up here, I mean, they get rocked. The Sixth Corps especially, these guys, good old Emory Upton's guys, uh, um, who are going to be very pivotal in the next campaign at Spotsylvania Courthouse, they are going to draw a lot of blood here from the Virginians and Louisianians here. But that kind of ends the fighting for May 5th around the Turnpike sector. And so, so they're so fall back before by we leave the block. turnpike, though, I do want to touch on one of my. Uh, Don't worry, we'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. I just, I want to. Are you going to talk about the the fire at all, or is that something oh, yeah. that I can touch on real brief? Yeah. I'll talk about it here. I mean, it's, I, I mean, it's a really good point that you bring up, and um, the fact that um, spring of '64 was very dry. There was a drought going on at the time of this campaign. Yeah, I just have a really good quote. I want to make sure yeah. we get this. Oh, no, yeah, here. yeah. So because of that, <laughs> a lot of the brambles, a lot of the brush, it's, it's very dry. And what do you have in a battle but a lot of sparks, a lot of gunpowder spilling on the ground, and a lot of fire. So, yeah, fire. Hot embers spilling. everywhere. I mean, and we're talking – I mean, there was fire at Chancellorsville. These fires, this is a raging forest fire. This is, like, not as bad as Australia wildfires. I won't say that. But no, we're wild, talking man. a raging inferno in the middle of a Civil War battle. And it's going to grow. Like, the fires that start on May 5th are going to be monstrous by the time we get to May 6th and 7th. Go ahead, Pat. What's your story? Yeah, yeah. so the reason that I, that I like to set the stage for this is because we always focus on bright and shiny things uh, in history. And we often forget the human story involved because we're chasing down glorious officers and, and this, that, and, and legends, right? Like, like we're recording this today, uh, which is May 2nd, and obviously tonight. Uh, one of the most famous Civil War generals is out on a really stupid reconnaissance, and he's going to get <laughs> shot by some of his own guys. And um, you know, and because of that, he's a legend in the sense that you know we never really got to see him fade or falter. He just kind of was who he was, inflated legend or not. You know, he's he is a competent battlefield commander that does enjoy 
uh, beating up the Union Army a few times, and because he's killed too soon, you know, this legend. So, um, so we forget the human stuff. So, so when this fire breaks out, it's not just breaking out and everybody goes, ah, and they're running for their lives. Guys, the Civil War battle's just been fought. There are wounded and maimed, and those who are otherwise unable to remove themselves from the battlefield. And remember, we're living in this sort of transitional time where Dr. John Letterman is sort of revolutionizing battlefield triage and the removal of the wounded actively under fire. So it's an imperfect system now. It's even more so an imperfect system in the literally the infancy years in which it was getting off the ground. So not every guy is getting grabbed, and certainly here at the wilderness, and it's much more, it's much more difficult to grab the wounded. Right. Um, Remember, we were talking logistics, so they're not grabbing these wounded, and so while these fires are breaking out, some of these guys can't move or do anything about yeah. it. Um, and so I have a quote here um, from from a private Frank Wilkinson. Wilkinson, his who, are great of wilderness. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, and he's got a great quote on it, and and his story is kind of unique in and of itself. But um, he essentially is commenting on the situation where he's watching his comrades and enemies burn to death, and, and the and it, it it moves to me. And he writes, "Quote: I saw many wounded soldiers in the wilderness who hung on to their rifles, and whose intention was clearly stamped on their pallid faces. I saw one man." both of whose legs were broken, lying on the ground with his cocked rifle by his side and his ramrod in hand, yep. and his eyes set on the front. I knew he meant to kill himself in case of fire. Knew it as surely as though I could read his thoughts. Yep. So, that I use that quote a lot on my walking tours there. Yeah, it's just powerful. It just lets you know that, like, you know, some of these, there are, some of these guys are willing to tolerate some things that, are unfathomable for us to tolerate the condition of, of warfare and, and combat. But the, the concept of burning to death. Yeah. Is too much. And That's another reason why this battle is one of my favorites to look at. And it sounds really morbid, but like no well, other the human should, element is everywhere here. There, and there's, I mean, like think of all the other woodland battles of the war, like Chickamauga and Shiloh and, and, you know, of course, Chancellorsville a year prior to this, none of them have the fire stories that wilderness has. And that's what makes wilderness unique. It gives these guys, each one of these battles in the Overland campaign is going to have something horrific about it that everyone can remember it for. For the wilderness, these guys will probably say this was the scariest battle of the war with the fire. The fact that the, the wounded now have to make a mad crawl or dash to one of the roads or to a stream or to either side of the line. And because literally the fire is cut right through no man's land. Yeah. Uh, and, and not only that, but like the living too, who have to sit on these trenches and have to hear screams. They got to the listen to their face. dying comrades they scream. They're everybody yelling out, pleading to them to come get them. And then they got to hear them scream as they're burned alive. And then they got to smell them. So, so like I've never smelled body cook before i can't imagine it's a pleasant experience imagine hundreds of bodies cooking in that fire like mm. so that so, that, that's, so with the the private battle. wilkinson though the human element strikes again in him yeah. twice twice more actually um with this so so everything you're describing is awful right you know that yeah. kind of that that manner of, of dying and then the the witness aspect of it, you know, having to listen to it, the helplessness of the victim, the helplessness of the of the of the witness, you know, like that situation is terrible. And imagine grown men who are grizzled, hearted veterans. This moves them. This is yeah. something that even after all the bloodshed and devastation of the war hits them in their souls. And so in that human, you know, that that moment alone is human enough. But guys. Yeah. I literally just said to you, grizzled, hardened, grown men, veterans, Private Wilkerson is mm -hmm. 16 years old. He is a friggin' young boy. He has lied. <laughs> he has lied to join the Army, uh, and he's with the 11th uh, Battery, New York Light uh, Artillery. And so here's the second uh, time. Uh, I guess the third time, rather, since, you know, he's, you know, affected by this in such a way to write about it. The third time is, is curiosity. Humans are curious, right? So yeah. the 11th Light Artillery is not really engaged. They is, he's more or less just chilling with his unit in this. I don't even think they're yeah. in reserve. I just think they're back. 
Yeah. So what does he do? Um, he takes an unapproved leave of absence, finds some infantry leathers and a musket, and he joins up with some of Hancock's infantry, and he ends up in this fight. Yep. He's an which artillerist. We're about to talk about is this, this fight around the Orange Plank Road, which is the most important area. Um, it's also where the fire is the thickest. It's where the most, I, I would say, the hardest fighting is done for this whole battle. Uh, now, did you want me to dive into that, or did you have more? I didn't mean to cut no, you I'm off. No, just, well, just to wrap up with him, because, you know, I mean, his story is, is yeah. amazing in the in the – in the sense that every other common soldier's story during this war is amazing. So, so he goes back to his unit the next day. He survives this fight. He survives yeah. this fire. He obviously writes the notation, right? But he goes back to his unit. He gets sort of reprimanded for his absenteeism. But, guys, we have a war to fight, all hands on deck kind of things, you know. Yeah. And um, so they allow him to remain with his unit, and he ends up fighting right like right after this, at Spotsylvania Courthouse. He's at Cold Harbor and yeah. literally on the field at Petersburg. So, but, like, and again, remember, I just said this kid's 16 years old, and I all those yeah. battles that he's going to take part in. But, you know, um, this is a, a war fought by uh, all sorts of people, men, women. Now, they're, they're, I'm not opening the door to the conversation of women disguised as men in the ranks, but women were involved in this war in a multitude of facets. So everybody involved experienced it in all these varying ways. And with him, he's got one of the most vivid – recollections of or, or recountings of the fire there and he's just yeah. a kid yeah yeah i absolutely agree and i mean like i said he'll be in probably the the heat of the of this battle the battle of the wilderness where it is decided for the most part in my opinion um so remember when i said that the most important part of this battlefield is the orange plank road brock road intersection well we're shifting down there so the only forces as the fighting is kicking off uh on the orange turnpike around midday uh there's a there's a delaying action happening on the orange plank road now if you recall there was one union cavalry regiment that's left on that road to basically be a reconnaissance force and that's the fifth new york cavalry under colonel john hammond and um hammond is going to see uh the vanguard of harry heath's division of uh, the confederate third corps of ap hill around 7 a.m. in the morning. And that's two hours after the heavy cavalry fighting had begun on the Catharpin Road two to three miles south of them. Now, if you're Hammond, you got some new uh, equipment this year. Uh, they are going to be armed with Spencer repeating rifles, and they're going to have this advantage of producing a much heavier volume of fire. And the Confederates are still, for the most part, armed with their Springfield or Enfield muzzle-loading muskets. Now, another advantage that Hammond's going to have is that Heath is in the main front column here for the 3rd Confederate Corps. Where was it that Heath was delayed by cavalry and then was surprised by the arrival of Union infantry at another battle? Where has that happened before? If you're thinking... Tell our listeners, Avery. Gettysburg, July Gettysburg, 1st. Pennsylvania. And literally, if you're Heath, it's like history is repeating itself. First, you got the orders. Don't bring on a general engagement. Don't do it. Not until we're all together. Not until the army's concentrated. Is it safe but to it, say that his boys got their dander up? The dander was up indeed on the morning of May 5th, but there was also a lot more caution because the 5th New York Cavalry, there's only about 500 guys in this regiment. They're facing roughly 25,000 Confederates marching at them. Now, the advantage they have is there's a lot of woods on either side of the Orange Plank Road. So their numbers are hidden for the most part, and they're going to be skirmishing. And he remembering the previous year's battle at Gettysburg, doesn't want to have another mistake here. So he's very unaggressive in pushing the 5th New York Cavalry back up the Orange Plank Road, pushing them back east towards the intersection. And Hammond needs to delay that. So Hammond's going to send couriers back to the closest Union command post, which is at Elwood, where the 5th Union Corps is, uh, their headquarters is, and saying, hey, we have massive amounts of enemy infantry massing on the Plank Road. They're moving to expose our flanks. If they get to that intersection, they could potentially block our road south. So Grant um, is going to basically tell me he's got to get forces down to that intersection as fast as possible. This is also another reason why the 6th Corps is late in getting into position on the Union 5th Corps right, because now you have a 6th Corps division being sent down to this Brock Road, Orange Plank Road intersection, and that is George Washington Gettys Division, which I just recently learned will take the highest number of casualties of any single division 
at a single battle. They're going to lose almost 2,400 men. And Holy the, moly. Out of a division of like, like 5,000 5, men. Uh, so things, it's pretty rough uh, for Getty's guys here, but they are the MVPs of this battle because Getty's division is going to haul ass as fast as they can all morning down the Germana Plank Road, through the Orange Turnpike Brock Road intersection, down the Brock Road to the Orange Plank Road intersection. They're going to arrive there around roughly i would say oh 11 a.m to uh 12 noon and they're going to get there right as uh harry heat's division is almost 100 yards away and uh the thing is getty's gonna have a really uh funny moment here where he stands in the middle or not stands he's atop his horse in the middle of the intersection completely exposed but he starts shouting orders and his men aren't even near him yet but he starts giving <laughs> commands, giving the facade that his troops are in position. And this works because he's going to have his men hold up and they're going to start to send skirmishers out. By the time these skirmishers for the Confederate line are feeling around that intersection, uh, he, uh, excuse me, Getty's in position and his one division is going to take on two divisions here of the Confederate third Corps. That's Harry Heath and Cadmus Wilcox division. That's right. So, so Wilcox and Heath are going to attack Getty. And Getty's going to be hard-pressed for most of midday into the early afternoon of May 5th. And things are going to get pretty dire here because he's outnumbered. Uh, his poor Vermonteers, the Vermont Brigade, if you are familiar with them, they're Lewis R. Uh, Lewis R. Grant's guys. They numbered about 2,500 men. They're going to take 1,234 casualties. That's one, two, three, four, exactly. Uh, <laughs> in almost about three hours of fighting around the, the intersection here. Uh, like I said, this is intense. This is the kind of stuff Frank Wilkinson is fighting in, but he's not with Getty. He'll be with second Corps because um, as the, uh, the third Corps of AP Hills men, they start to push up. Um, they don't push up in force. Richard Anderson's division of the third Corps, they're held in reserve. Lee is going to be on the battlefield by this point around midday to the afternoon. And uh, he's going to have Anderson spend as his only fresh reserve. He's trying to find out just where in the heck is Longstreet. Longstreet's lost. He took the wrong turn. So Longstreet's not going to be on the field of battle until early morning, May 6th. And that's very important to remember. Also, Samuel Crawford's Pennsylvania Reserves were still around the tuning farm. Now, here's an episode that I find very, very funny. It is a um, moment where A.P. Hill, Jeb Stewart, and Robert E. Lee are sitting in the middle of the Widow Tap field. And this is uh, abreast or adjacent to the Orange Plank Road. Uh, they have a couple other cavalry commanders there, but most of the Third Corps, uh, the Cadmus, Wilcox, Heath's divisions, they're a couple hundred yards up the road, almost like two miles up the road. Then you have Anderson's men a couple miles back down the road. There's, there's nobody around them. There's no big body of troops. And I believe it's men from Crawford's PA Reserves that enter this field from the north. They come down from the tuning farm, and they just kind of – open up in this field now they see lee and his men lee and his staff see them and a lot of very interesting things happen here so first of all uh jeb stewart <laughs> um just kind of walks away he just he just kind of saunters off uh ap hill <laughs> stands up and uh you know just kind of stares at him and robert e. lee just ignores them these pennsylvanians um they basically just are not Pennsylvania. I, I assume they're Pennsylvanians. I'm not sure once again, but these union soldiers, they just kind of continue to advance. And then it's a mad dash to get everyone out of the field. So uh, one of um, one of the accounts is of AP Hill's uh, horse or his aide leaving him behind and he's running after his horse. Um, <laughs> and basically it's, it's just a helter skelter kind of situation. Um, but for the most part, it, it's a it's a very interesting episode because literally these guys could have captured Lee. Yeah, he's don't. like, you know, the war could have ended on, you know, May 5th, 1864, yeah. instead of yeah. uh, more or less, you know, a whole year from now. Yep, yep. But nevertheless, uh, these guys fall back. And eventually Crawford's going to fall back from the tuning farm. He's going to give up that high ground position. Uh, Anderson's men are going to move on to that position later that day. And when Crawford tries to kind of get back there, he's going to run into resistance and uh, basically a bungled opportunity there. But nevertheless, we're getting back to this fighting around the Orange Plank Road, Brock Road intersection. And it's around three o'clock in the afternoon that uh, Winfield Scott Hancock's second corps starts to arrive to reinforce Getty. So now the second corps is on the field and the second corps 
is a fresh batch of troops. They start to basically make a line along the Brock Road. So think of the intersection, Orange Plank Road's the east-west road, Brock Road's the north-south road. They're going to be on either side of the Orange Plank Road going this way, going vertical. And they're going to expand that line. They're going to create literally log walls, just stack trees on top of each other. And they're going to create a pretty formidable entrenchment around Brock Road. They're going to repulse the Confederate attacks, uh, what they had been doing all morning or all midday into the afternoon. And now they're going to push APL a little further back, not quite back to Tapfield, but um, a little further uh, behind them. So uh, also Hancock's got four divisions in his core. Three of them are up and ready. So it's two. Uh, so three of them plus Getty against two Confederate divisions. That's two to four odds. Don't let them oh, yeah. your Confederate. Another major thing to consider here is it gets later around five o'clock, the fighting starts to die down for the day on May 5th. First day of the Battle of the Wilderness. Both sides uh, really have nothing much to show for it. It's very much an Antietam-style battle. There was a lot of back and forth. Yeah, and a, a lot, lot of ebb and flow, but a lot of nothing. A lot of nothing. But what's important is that the Brock Road is still in the hands of the Union Army. And Grant basically is going to call Hancock up and say, hey, not call him up on the phone, but just be like, hey, man, we need to get them as far away from that intersection as possible. We need to start advancing right away. They can't be in the vicinity of that. It's kind of like the LZ X-ray rule is what I call it from We Were Soldiers. You need to engage the enemy as far away from the LZ as possible, but we need to engage the enemy as far away from the Rock Road as possible. So we need to get them away from here. And the best way to do that is to attack them. So basically, Hancock, Grant, Meade, they start to make plans for a massive assault for the morning of May 6th. And this right. night, yeah, is where things are going to start to take effect. Another thing to remember is Lee is thinking Longstreet's going to be coming up any moment. And he's quickly going to still like 10 miles away. Long Street's still, yeah, they're hauling butt to try to get there as fast as possible. But AP Hill uh, was never updated on this progress. So AP Hill does not tell his men, that's Wilcox and his divisions, to dig in. They basically just sit and they go, okay. They, they, they basically stop where they, uh, they uh, last fought and they make defensive positions, uh, but not real great ones. They don't really dig in. Uh, they're not in the best position to dig in either. So they almost like encamp that night within about 200 yards of the Union line, maybe closer. And that's not good because they are incredibly outnumbered. They're not in a great defensive position, and they have no idea that the Union is planning this massive assault. Now, right, and this is, yeah. this is why Grant's figuring, you know, this is all helping, I guess, to aid Grant's figuring that, that Grant thinks that these guys are a prime target. Yeah. You know, he thinks that they're spent. He thinks that they're, you know, the fact that they're just sort of in this sort of poor setup, not really planned out position. He's like, look, essentially they're viewing this as like, look, they are spent. They're disorganized. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely the, the third Confederate Corps is going to have a really hard fight in this battle. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is that, yeah, A.P. Hill's men, Wilcox and Heath, they, they get bloodied up pretty badly here on the first day. Um, but, yeah, Hill makes a very critical error in not telling his men to dig in. Some do, but it's not enough. And, so yeah, so moving – so real quick, man, just to move this along, because this story is huge. So, so Lee, Lee knows his guys are in a bad spot, and he still mm -hmm. allows them to rest because he, like, you know, I am, he's assuming long – Here's why. Yeah, so Long Street in the morning, in the wee hour mornings of May 6th before any fighting happens while it's still dark out, uh, he's going to send a courier up to Lee saying, hey, I'm going to be on the field by around uh, like 7 a.m. pretty much. Yeah, like dawn. He's like, I'll yeah, be there when the sun's coming up. I'm going to be there when the sun's coming up. Well, guess when the Union assault's planned for? Um, right before the sun's coming up. 6 a.m. <laughs> One hour <laughs> before. Like right before Literally an hour before Long Street's supposed to be there, that's when the Union's going to make the assault. So timing-wise, isn't great for the Confederates because doesn't, even, doesn't it even kick off earlier than that? Like doesn't Hancock right. get into action around five? Around five a.m. they start to skirmish. The major push, the like I should say, the route begins around six a.m. But yes, um, you are correct, sir. At five a.m., uh, Hancock. Wait, starts correct me if I'm wrong. You guys get spooked, and they start to scrap before they they're they're skirmishing. There's like a lot of skirmishing. Five in the morning. There's a lot of skirmishing going on going on around Saunders Field. Uh, Ewell's got. I think it's Ewell's guys that fire first, though. Because because Ewell has Jubal Early's guys up in the woods, uh, north of Saunders Field. They're they're going to be 
squaring off against Horatio Wright and James Ricketts divisions of the six union core. Um, but they're not doing a lot. They're really just cracking at each other. Um, and the same could be said for further down the line. Now, in this attack that's coming, you're going to have three second core divisions. I don't know all of them. Just stick with me here. It's John Gibbs, <laughs> David Burney, and um, oh, God. I believe it's Gershon Mott. It might just be Bernie and Gibbon at the morning. Um, but Mott's in reserve. Barlow is further down the road. Um, but nevertheless, you got three second core divisions. You have James Wadsworth's fifth core division also coming down on loan from the, uh, from the fifth core. Uh, you also have Getty's sixth core division still going to be committing troops to this fight. So it's five union divisions that are going to be making an assault here in the morning of May 6th. Around 5 a.m., they're going to start to leave their entrenchments as quietly as they can in mass, mass numbers, bayonets fixed as they press into that forest. Uh, also coming in, Grant's going to order Burnside to bring the Ninth Corps in. Burnside's not going to get to the field till about midday because he decides that breakfast is more important than following orders. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, they're oh, going to be goodness. delayed. So the Ninth Corps is, I know, breakfast is important. Um, <laughs> but Burnside and the Ninth Corps, they're also on their way. They were also supposed to be part of this assault, but they're going to be late. They're going to miss it. Um, so what happens is um, these five Union divisions, they move out. And if you're a Confederate, there's one account of a guy in the – and I believe it's uh, the old Pettigrew Brigade, these North Carolinians, they look out um, on the morning, <laughs> I know, on the morning of May 6th, he looks out from behind his little breastwork that he had built, and he just sees a solid wall of blue advancing in the morning mist of May 6th. And at that exact moment, the Union let out this monstrous bellow. Everyone tells you the rebel yell is terrifying, which I'm sure it was. But imagine being a rebel on the end of the Yankee bellow, as I've learned to call it, because that <laughs> thunders through these woods and they smash right into Wilcox and Heath to the point where literally for the first time in the war, an entire core, at least two thirds of it, of the Army of Northern Virginia is routed. Yeah. They're not, they're not doing a fighting withdrawal. Some units are, but for the most part, these guys they're start running. to run. They yeah, throw down running. the weapons and they run. This is literally first Manassas on a much larger scale um, before Jackson's stupid stand. But anyway, the point is <laughs> you have these guys running. If you're Robert E. Lee, it's around 6 a.m. 6.30 comes around. For about half an hour, you're in tap field and streaming back down the road and the disorganized rundown units of Wilcox and Heath's divisions. Imagine what that does to your psyche if you're Robert E. Lee. Your army doesn't run. Since you have commanded it, they have never run. This but this is where – so I got a buddy. Close your mind. Yes, I got a buddy of mine who will absolutely fly up to here to Maryland and beat me up if I don't mention this because he, he's from Texas, and he's real of proud of what's about to happen. Here. Yeah, if you're Lee, it's, it's not looking good. The only reserve he has is Anderson, but Anderson's too busy – protecting Ewell's flank. So literally right. there are no immediate soldiers in tap field. There's nobody guarding the Confederate right flank. That, that flank has been destroyed. It's gone. The third Corps is running. So now. And remember this, the Union is advancing yeah. through Pogue's guns and Pogue has yeah, 16 Pogue guns. Is only, Pogue is the only obstacle in their way in tap field. But Pogue is an effective obstacle because like, oh, yeah. I'm an artillery Pogue. geek. So here's what Pogue's got on the ground. He's got 16 guns. He's got an array of Napoleons, some capture parrot rifles, and he is just blasting away canister at these guys. That, coupled with the fact that the Second Corps' momentum starts to get sapped almost immediately after this route. They're pushing forward. They're advancing. But these units are becoming disorganized in this terrain. That's they just got jacked up, too, with all that shrapnel and the land. Yeah, like those I mean, guys they're, getting, are they're, getting, they're getting held cooked. up there. But it's mostly the topography. I mean, Poe's doing his job, but it's the topography that's sapping the momentum of this Union assault. But for, sure. for the most part, Grant's objective has been accomplished. He's gotten the Confederates away from the Brock Road. Right. And so here we have things going from bad to worse for the Union forces, because right as all seems lost for the Confederacy, in dramatic fashion, a body of soldiers arrive. The stars are bright, big <laughs> at night. <laughs> Deep in the heart of Texas, because yeah, this I, is where John Gregg's 800 guys, the yep. Texas Brigade, show up. Exactly. Longstreet's Vanguard finally now, hits that, the field. 
now here's the thing. This, these 800 Texans, by far, are very brave for sure, but they're not going to have a good morning either um, because they get here and they're like the first to basically say, hey, General Lee, we, Longstreet wants us to tell you, you know, he's coming, but we're here. We're here. We're letting everybody know we're coming. So that's all Lee needs to know that Longstreet's arriving literally in the nick of time. Now, Longstreet needs more time to get his troops on the field to bring them up the Orange Plank Road to get them around Tap Field. So basically, Greg's guys, these Texans, are going up against almost 22,000 Union soldiers, and they only number 800. Right. And as they advance, it, it's a suicide mission, pretty much. And they it's pumping them up, man. Lee gets caught yeah. up in this. Well, here's the thing. And there's the thing. So Lee's going to try to ride with these guys, command them personally. Uh, and these Texans literally halt in the middle of Tap Field. And they start to rally around Lee and Travelers, chanting Lee to the rear. Lee to the rear. We will not go forward until you go back. Lee to the rear. Now, this has been examined many, many years, for many, many years in the park and, and by tourists and by history buffs alike. I mean, this is something that I would think a lot of people would say, oh, this is Lee getting lost in a moment and jazzed up. And I'm like, okay, so is it safe to say that him doing something that an Army commander is not supposed to do is proof that, I think Grant's rattling his cage just a little. People would not like to admit it, but I'm like, you're not Robert E. Lee if you are out with these men. He knows where he's supposed to be. He knows that it's dangerous. He knows that if he goes with these guys, he'll be killed or captured because guess what's going to happen to Greg's Texans? Yeah, they're going to go forward. They're going to smash right into these Union forces. They're also picking a fight with a large body of troops. 400 of these 800 Texans will fall in 30 minutes. 30. In half an hour, they lose half of their strength. 50% casualties. That sucks. Every yeah. regiment loses half its number. There's four regiments, three Texas, one Arkansas. They lose half their numbers in 30 minutes. I mean, it's rough. But Lee had been sent to the rear by them because, you know, a courier rides up and says, hey, uh, General Lee, General Longstreet's looking for you. And so Lee's like, okay, I guess I should go consult with him, do, 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 and rides back <laughs> off the field. And Tap Field becomes the killing field for the Texans. But that Texan assault, mixed with Pogue's artillery, mixed with the topography, has utterly stopped the Union advance. And yeah. here things get worse because the rest of Longstreet's corps start to arrive around 730. And so these guys are, are pretty stacked. They're foot sore. Uh, they've been marching all night, marching all day, marching all morning. And here they are going right into the fight. Uh, leading their assault is Charles Field's uh, division. They're going to be on the right side, south side of Orange Plank Road. Joseph Kershaw is going to be yeah, on, the north side. on the right. Okay. So, yeah, they push forward. They slash right into Hancock's forces. And they're going to fight for about an hour and a half in very back and forth seesaw motion. They're just shooting at point blank at each other in these woods. Around this time, uh, Burnside's Ninth Corps is crossing the Rapidan River. They are now moving into the battle zone, I would call it. Uh, they're passing behind the 6th and 5th Corps lines as this is all happening. Um, but here's where things get uh, a little worse for, for the 2nd Corps before they get better. Uh, Moxley Sorrell, uh, good old Moxley from Gettysburg, he is going to command a body of Confederate troops from Fields Division. Um, these are about three brigades, I believe. And these brigades are going to find an unfinished railroad cut in the woods south of the Orange Plank Road. They're going to follow this cut and find that it goes right past the open left flank of the Union Second Corps. And they are going to launch a flank attack at this Second Corps around 9 a.m. And it rolls, according to Hancock, it rolls up his lines like a wet like blanket. Like a wet blanket, yeah. I love that quote because now, Hancock's now, just yeah. like, dude, they, they licked us. They got us. Now, here's the thing. This is a fighting withdrawal. It's, and a lot of people say it was the Union's turn to run. I'm like, I'm sure those first couple of units absolutely ran. But like the 11th Corps at Chancellorsville, like Scherz's men and von Steimer's men, there are units that do do a fighting withdrawal in good order. Not to mention the Confederates of Longstreet's Corps find the same problem. They're sapped by the momentum. Their momentum is sapped by the topography. They get disorganized very quickly. Another thing to mention, folks, there's a lot of smoke. A lot of smoke. There are fires going on for, for one, and then there's just the discharging of muskets. Yeah, there's yeah. black powder war There's taking black powder place. smoke everywhere. You can't see. It's filtering through the trees. It's literally hanging in the branches and obscuring visibility. 
So these are all things to remember in the midst of this fight. Now, the second core is falling back. They're falling back all the way to where their attack started at the Brock Road, Orange Plank Road intersection, but that's their objective. They get behind their walls and they wait. Now, this is where things also, probably one of the most ironic and hauntingly similar situations happen. Longstreet is riding at the column, or the head of his columns. He's got a fresh batch of troops, uh, South Carolina Brigade under Colonel Minka Jenkins. And Jenkins, uh, his men had just been fresh off of, um, of uh, not, I guess, furlough. They're just like R&R, basically, in Charleston. They have brand new uniforms. And these uniforms were black. They were, supposed to, they were described as black or like a dark gray, like a, like a charcoal gray. And they were nice and shiny, kind of like Union Blue can be. Um, and they are going to be marching along the Orange Plank Road. They come within the lines of uh, William Mahone's Virginians that yeah. had made a flank attack or about an hour earlier. It's around 10.30 a.m. with Vaughn Street riding with these men and Jenkins' men that the Virginians see the South Carolinians, mistake them for Union soldiers, and open fire. Yep, and Longstreet gets hit in the neck, and it's not a little it's scratch. Not a little scratch. It goes basically in the base of his neck, and it exits out his back. Um, Jenkins is killed instantly. He takes a bullet to the dome. He's dead. Um, yeah. And the South Carolinians get hit pretty hard. They also fire back into the Virginians. The Virginians take uh, minor casualties, but you know it's still a really bad friendly fire incident. What is scary about it is that it's four miles from the exact spot where Jackson was shot by his own men literally almost a year to the day. Now, it was May 6th in the morning uh, in 1864, and then, of course, that was the night of May 2nd, 1863, um, which at this point in the night, Jackson has been hit. He is down. But anyway, the point is, <laughs> um, Longstreet's down, and when Longstreet goes down, the Confederate momentum disappears. Yeah, it's and Longstreet's not just down for a little bit, guys. Longstreet's out of this game until for, October. Uh, months. He's That's out right. until October, so October. five months. Six Five. months? Yeah. I don't do math very well. But, you know. No, we're historians. That's what we do. <laughs> July. August. We can do, we can do oh, core. Okay. Yeah, we can do six core months. division yeah. brigades. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's out for about five to six months. No, he's down. And, and that's the thing. But for Lee, you know, your morning, you're not having a great morning. I mean, your army's still intact. But, man, you guys got routed at the very start of it. You got saved. And then the guy who just saved it just got shot by his own men, just like Jackson. So, yeah, um, Lee's got to take some time to plan. There's going to be a little lull around the midday on May 6th down around this fight. And it's basically Lee deciding what's going to happen. Not to mention uh, the situation becomes a little more uh, confusing because now Burnside's on the field. And the Ninth Corps is going to send Orlando Wilcox Division from Elwood down to kind of fill in the gap between the Union Fifth Corps and the Union Second Corps. And the Ninth Corps is going to stay in that position for the rest of the battle. And so Wilcox's men are now threatening Lee's left flank on the woods north of the Orange Plank Road. But he's still got this, this Union line around the Brock Road. Lee knows that he has to take that intersection if he wants to stop the Union advance. So what is he going to do? He's going to put Charles Field in command of the First Corps. And Field is going to have to be in charge in making an all-out assault with two Confederate divisions against the Brock Road, Orange Plank Road intersection. The way I told this to visitors is like, imagine a picket charge style fight, a picket charge style mount of men in beautiful battle lines in the middle of the forest. <laughs> so you can't really see it for its scope, but these guys are going to launch an all out assault. And the second core pulverizes this assault. They right, because the, the Confederates are in this flux confusion commands changing moment yep. and Yep. All Hancock has had to do is just uh, entrench well, himself. Yep. And they absolutely deliver a nasty blow. The First Corps takes horrendous casualties here. Uh, and like I said, it's very heavy fighting. Now, one brigade of Confederates breaks through, and it's at a part of the earth of these uh, breastworks, these log works, that catch fire. And it is uh, William Hennigan, South Carolinians. There's a very dramatic scene that everyone, every Southerner everywhere loves to talk about when they come to the wilderness. It's them jumping through fire like tigers in a circus. And uh, what they never get to is the fact that when Hennigan's men got through these breastworks, uh, they were instantly pulverized by parrot rifles that were just waiting for them, like 20 yeah. to 50 on his back. I mean, hey, uh, listen like here, Confederate Joe Exotic. We got something here called canister. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's great. I mean, just point-blank artillery canister rounds that annihilate Hennigan's brigade and drive them back. 
And so this is all happening between roughly noon and three o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, Wilcox's ninth corps division, his troops are going to be stopped by Cadmus Wilcox's third corps. They reorganized a little bit and they're going to basically uh, stay in, um, in, um, kind of in reserve, but they're going to hold Wilcox off. The fighting is very disorganized there. Um, but for the most part, uh, what's, what's interesting is Anderson's still, his troops have not done any fighting really during this whole battle. His division is going to be pretty fresh. Um, but nevertheless, they're held in reserve. Now, Lee fails in taking that intersection. That was the whole point of that massive assault, right. was to grab that intersection. It fails. It fails. Lee's attack fails. You need to hear it. For those of you out there that need to hear that, that was a failure. Say it loud, brother. Was a failure. So that's something that we always seem to forget when we look at the wilderness. We just see Grant's attacks failing. Guess whose other attacks failed? That's Robert E. Lee. But what's Grant's main objective is to hold that road open. And guess what? He's able to do that on May 6th. Now, that pretty much wraps up the fighting around the Orange Plank Road. And as I have described, it, it, it was where the, this, this battle is decided. And I would say that Grant is victorious in holding that road open that objective is achieved. And it's very similar to kind of that. If you look at those battle lines on May 6th, it almost resembles that fishhook kind of situation at Gettysburg. If the Union's uh, is successful at that fishhook, the Union's also successful here on May 6th in holding that position and holding that road open. Now here's where things all, where I get it thrown right back at me is that whoever gets, it seems like whoever gets the last punch in wins the battle. Um, because well, who the last, cares? Because remember, Grant's not fighting to win battles anymore. He's fighting to win he, wars. He says, you know, if we can annihilate the Confederate Army in one swell swoop, swoop that's great, but that's probably not going to happen. We well, just that's why he prepares to, to win a battle, but he also prepares to win a war of attrition. Exactly. So, and here's the thing. As the fighting's dying down there, uh, there is an incident. We're going to go right back up north of us to the Orange Turnpike, back to Saunders Field, uh, back to the U, uh, Confederate Second Corps front. Uh, there's been a, a lot of uh, fighting going on within the lines here, within the command structure. John B. Gordon, the Georgia Brigade commander and Juba Early's division, has been fighting with Juba Early all day, pretty much, to launch a flank assault in support of the 1st Confederate Corps assault down on the other end. He wants to take his troops out and around the right flank of the Union line, and that's basically Ricketts' division. The 6th Corps division is the end of the line. These guys also will be facing Gordon and his men at Monoxy, Pat. That's this right. Literally the start of that crap that's going to go all the way to July. I mean, seriously, that's crazy how it works out. But yeah. There's a lot of poetic justice in the American Civil War like that. Yeah. Units on units, Irish Brigade on Irish legions at Fredericksburg. There's The Civil War is full of these, the human yeah. aspect of this. What earlier's division, literally, that will become Gordon's division uh, eventually at Monoxy, these units are literally locked in battle with each other for the next three months and really bad fighting um uh, it's like in chancellorsville right you have howard's corps uh engaging uh like and then on, at gettysburg on the first day they're the same yeah. and they're fighting the same guys they were fighting at chancellorsville yep. it's literally it's not even poetic justice it's just a really crappy situation yeah, it's just terrible <laughs> yeah but anyway <laughs> Tragic uh, early, early has been saying all day no assault no we're supposed to stay in place uh, Lee has not ordered that. General Lee is, you know, whatever. And Gordon's like, well, this is a really important thing to me. And I'm going to basically be really insubordinate here. I'm going to go around you. I'm going to go to Ewell. General Ewell, sir, do you think I have a good idea? Because General Early doesn't think I have a good idea. But I think this would really be beneficial. So John B. Gordon is an asshole here. And he basically should have been court-martialed. And, but instead, Early just threatens him and gets really angry and yells at him. And Ewell, being not the strongest guy leader that he could have been just is like uh you know i'm just gonna i'll be right back you know i'll figure it out and he doesn't Wait, address this is one of those times where you kind of got flaky a little bit like like i'm like put your foot in both these guys asses and yeah. tell them to do their jobs yeah, but like go to work yeah yeah and so it's not until about 5 p.m after the fighting has died down that lee rides up to check on you sector the line and gordon and early are still going at it and Lee hears about this and says, well, I like General Gordon. Uh, I'd say if he has a plan, just let him carry it out pretty much. Pretty much. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say something. I, in a certain light, in a certain sense, John 
Gordon is one of those guys that I enjoy talking about and reading about. And I don't do that typically with too many yeah. Confederate, but it's, I think it's because in Black Hawk Down, Ewan McGregor's character, when yeah. they're finally evacuing out, he's in the APC and they're yeah. just kind of sitting there and he wants to get moving. And he's like, these things are an epic bullet magnet. Yeah. That's kind of how I feel about John magnet. Gordon. John Brown Gordon is a Civil War bullet magnet. He really and is. he like it's lives through all of it. I know. It's a shame none could kill him because he goes on to find the Georgia Ku Klux Klan. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. No, no. That's what I, said. Like, I know. I know. I know you don't. I'm just saying for anyone out there that loves Gordon. Yeah, he's a he's a scumbag. So Yeah, no. After the war, he's, he's got undeniable. He murders, people. He murders black folk. Like yeah, he's got undeniable, hateful baggage in his life. I just, yeah. uh, when we talk about these guys in the military sense, I'm just, I'm astounded that this guy has no military history, uh, yeah. shows up, he becomes one of the most proficient commanders on a battlefield. He's wounded a bajillion times, sometimes you know, like in the face. Yes. And, uh, ah. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, he's on the losing side, thankfully. Uh, yeah. And, uh, but he's a part of a pretty spectacular moment at the end, too. And it's like, he's everywhere. He's wounded. He's like... Yep. And he's going to have the last word at, at the wilderness here. And that's where people say, oh, it's definitely a tactical draw. And some people are brazen enough to say it's a Confederate victory. Um, now, now, before we get into this, I want to set the stage for our audience, because this is something we talked a little bit about in our little pre-production. This is, this is a big bone you like to pick, you know, as far as as the civil war and how we address legacy and legend. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's ironic because, you know, we've mentioned a few times specifically on this program because of the day we're recording it on, you know, today, you know, is the day, you know, what are we, uh, can't do math here. It's so 20, 157th anniversary yeah. of what is arguably Jackson's finest moment on a battlefield, right? His, his very creepy gray march, you know, where he sneaks up on the, the Union Army yep. and, and they go rolling through uh, Howard's camp and, and the 11th Corps and all that stuff. And, and here we are um, about to flirt with that legacy in a different way yeah. a little bit. And, 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 and you like to sort of get real. Yeah. So, so let's get real with our listeners. Avery. Oh, I'll get real. So here, <laughs> and let's talk about Gordon's last Gordon word at the wilderness. Ends the battle of the wilderness on the night of May 6th by making a flank assault against the Union right flank, against the Union Sixth Corps. He displaces two brigades of Union infantry. That's Alexander Shaler and Treeman Seymour. Uh, captures, I believe, both of them. Um, and uh, the problem is, is that... Everyone believes that this is just a repeat of what Jackson did at Chancellorsville, and it should it deserves just as much recognition. What does it solve for the Confederates? And the answer is not a damn thing, because Gordon's objective is to route the Union line completely, smash through it, and get to the Germana Plank Road, cut their base of supplies, and basically, you know, cut them off from escape, cut right. them off from the Rapidan River doesn't even get freaking close to the Germana Plank Road. And instead, the Union Six Corps doesn't break. It, it's not routed. It literally, if you, can, you can't see it, but I'm taking my hands here, and he bend, the Six Corps bends its line back like this. And what that does is it doesn't break. It, it just bends, but it doesn't break. Not like the 11th Corps at Chancellorsville. Not like, you know, it doesn't displace. They're still in the same position. They're going to withdraw a little bit, but they're going to bend their lines back. It does not break. Gordon's guys they get disorganized almost immediately. Their assault begins at 9 p.m. It's dark by that point in those woods. So it's night fighting. It's chaotic. Gordon has already heard about Longstreet getting shot by his own men, and that was during the day. He does not want that to happen to him, so he's going to call off the assault. But he claims it as a success because he's displaced the entire right flank of the Union line, which literally just bent back on itself, connected with the plank road to have further uh, connection there. Uh, and holding the, the forward itself is Ferrero's USCTs, those black troops. They're kind of the last linchpin on that road there and the last linchpin on that Union line. They don't go anywhere near the fighting. But Gordon's flank attack is very small, doesn't accomplish much. If you want to say a similar flank attack in accomplishing something big, it goes to Longstreet. But yet, we can never give James Longstreet credit because, God forbid, he didn't 
listen to Lee at Gettysburg. And he, he's, he's a Republican after the war, too. And, and blah, 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 blah. And so that's what I'm saying. I'm like, I mean, you know look, you're barking me? up. You're, you're preaching to the choir yeah. with me at Longstreet. Like, I, yeah. I tell people all the time that if you are, are one of these people that really takes an honest look at this, yeah. Longstreet's the guy that should be glorified by the people that glorify really? the Confederacy. He's a better general than Jackson. He's he a better general than almost anybody than in the war. And here's a testament to how good he is. Yeah. He's so good that at a time when, the, when Lee could spare him the least, which is after they just got their asses whipped in Pennsylvania, yep. at a time when he literally can't do anything other than keep his army together, Longstreet's so good that Grant, what? Or, uh, Lee goes, I need you to go to the Western Theater and fix it. Yeah. And what's great is Longstreet and Grant are best friends. They're in the same class. Like, they know this. Like, they're very similar in their leadership on the battlefield. And, I mean, one thing I've never been able to find is if Grant learns about Longstreet's wounding. And, you know, hearing that his former best friend and will be best friend after the war as well, um, you know, hearing that. I mean, imagine hearing your best friend's on the other side and he's down. It's like the Hancock. Army well, do you guys. think it was something like that? Not the both of us. Oh, well, Grant was <laughs> hit. I know Grant. <laughs> cough, cough on the cigar. Now, um, also, Grant's going to smoke a total of about twenty cigars during the entire battle. Um, twenty thousand cigars, you mean 20, during the 20, battle? 20, no, no. I 20. thought it was twenty thousand. <laughs> twenty thousand cigars. I don't think anyone can do it. Not even General Grant, and he was pretty much a locomotive. Um, but yeah, <laughs> here's where things get crazy, and here's where um, the Union. Army of the Potomac officers give the Confederates way more credit is that during and after Gordon's flank attack, there is a panic at Meade's headquarters. There's a panic at LA. I love this story. Everybody because... starts freaking the hell out, saying it's Chancellorsville all over again. Our we lines are collapsing. We gotta get back to their forwards. And, and Grant, in probably the best leadership moment of the entire war, one of them anyway, he's got a lot of them. One I of love them, he says, I need you all to stop worrying about what Robert E. Lee is doing and start worrying about what you will do. And it literally shuts it. it everyone's like, Oh, shit. like, you know, yeah. like, yeah. it's like, I can't believe you idiots. We're fine. We're not like we have, our line is stable. We have stabilized. We're going to be okay. They haven't done anything to us that we can't undo. We are okay. I'm sick and tired of you guys holding this enemy is enemy general to such a higher standard that you would literally throw down everything and run when you can do so much more and get back to your units and assess that damage and i'm like damn you yeah get it, grant. yeah go go get it grant so here's get it. here's the full quote because i just pulled yeah. it up because the 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 language in the quote is oh, it's, so it's, it's savage, savage. Oh, I love it's, it. he eviscerates him he says and this is grant so so here, here it says, uh, I guess some, some officer uh, is, is essentially a costing grant with these, yeah. these panicked, you know, what notions you that the lines are collapsing. And he says, one of the officers says, quote, grant, General Grant, this is a crisis that cannot be looked upon, uh, but too seriously. I, I know Lee's methods well by past experience, and he's going to throw his whole army between us and the Rapidan and completely cut off our communications. And yeah. then that's when Grant snaps. And what Grant says is, Grant says, quote, Oh, I am heartily tired of hearing about what Lee is going to do. Some of you always seem to think he is suddenly going to turn yep. a double somersault and land in our rear and on both of our flanks at the same time. Go yep. back to your commands and try to think about what we are going to do ourselves instead of what yep. Lee is going to do. Oh, it was probably, it, it was probably <laughs> silent in that tent. Yep. It was Everyone, just like, Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. And I'm like, and there's a thing about that. I'm like, as that's happening, do you see the six core panicking? Do you see, like, they're literally getting their lines under control. Cedric is like, we're good. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he's like, I got it. We, I, we, we, were, we were bungled there for a bit, but, I, you know, we stabilized. I mean, look, Cedric takes, you know, a lot of heat here and there throughout his, his command yeah. of the six core. But I'll say this Cedric is effective. He knows what he's doing. And he's, he, I, I find him more or less doing the best with what he's got and not really wasting much opportunity. Yeah. 
So, yeah. so and, I'm not surprised here that Cedric is among the first to be getting their proverbial shit together uh, yeah. in light of these quote collapsing lungs. There's, there's definitely there. It's the, this test of leadership is going to continue for the Army of the Potomac. Uh, unfortunately for Cedric, in the next three days, he will be dead. Um, and um, for Warren, he's going to continue to be under a microscope. His performance at Spotsylvania leaves a lot more to be desired than his performance at the Wilderness. Hancock uh, still does very well, but his guys are literally in the worst places at the worst times. And he's also still suffering from a wound that he sustained at Gettysburg. There's still a bit of saddle wedged in his hip area. And it's painful as hell to ride a horse. And uh, he's not in a great mood. And then Burnside is Burnside. He's very sluggish. Um, in his movement, Hi guys. There's, there, there's that, there's that command, uh, issue of, you know, who do I answer to and who do my men answer to and all this, blah, blah, blah. And this lack of coordination that you're going to see. Um, but literally the battle of the wilderness ends with the union line stabilizing. And I ask you this, and this is the proverbial rhetorical question. Were the Confederates successful in cutting Grant off in his communications? No. Were they successful in stopping Grant's advance? No. Were they successful in retaking the Orange Plank Rock Road intersection? No. Now, was Grant successful in holding that road open? Yes. Was he successful in destroying the Confederate Army? No. But was that his goal from the beginning? No. So there are a lot of things to consider when looking at the end results here. And this is where things get also a little more muddled up. Uh, Grant starts getting the first casualty lists uh, or listings for the, the Army. And this is just something that Grant is definitely being sensitized to. Um, if you look at his army's losses, uh, or at least the casualties in previous battles that he's fought, whether they were at Shiloh, Donaldson, Vicksburg, Chattanooga, if you literally examined the uh, Union casualty listings at those battles, and I'm not even talking Vicksburg because it's a campaign, but even those individual battles, if you want to look at it, the casualties that Grant sustains in these two days are the heaviest he's ever sustained in a single battle. Right. And it hits – He's, he's not used to it, and, and he doesn't like sending men to their death. There's an account uh, from Horace Porter that Grant, uh, he hears him crying in his tent uh, on the night of May 6th into May 7th, um, and a lot of lost causers have taken that to be like, yeah, the little bitch is crying because Lee walked all over him. No, no, he's actually got a soul, and he's you know feeling for the men that died, and he's also hearing the screams in the distance of these guys burning alive because those fires and, and the smell Still of the yeah, like, you know, sorry, the guy has a soul and, you know, not the stomach for that because nobody does. Um, See, I've thought about this moment a lot because yeah. I also think that this is a moment where in much the same way in Gods and Generals, they give that stupid scene where Stonewall Jackson finally starts crying over the death of that girl. And, yeah. and they're all confused, like, with all the blood. And, all and they're saying he's crying for all of them kind of yeah. thing. There's a part of me that wonders if, if part of Grant's alleged you know sort of breakdown yeah, that's the thing. we don't know if it's confirmed right it's but part of me wonders if this sort of alleged break you know with the emotion and he, and, he, and he does you know grieve a little bit is i wonder if it's a premonition not it's a like a foreshadowing because i wonder it's, if he knows the cost that's gonna well he come. knows what's coming yeah. because these same casualty numbers that he's upset about He's also done the basic math, and he's realized that even though these are the highest casualties he's taken, in terms of percentage overall for the force that he's got, Lee has actually taken worse casualties. Oh, yeah. So let's and do it. Yeah. This is the first time that Grant has figured out, I can replace my guys, and Lee can't. And yep. so I think there's a part of Grant that's weeping, maybe for what he knows is coming. Because remember, he's not playing to win battles. He's not coming to pussyfoot Quite around. Fair. The bottom line is to win the war. And how to do that is to destroy right. Lee's army. Yeah. Destroying Lee's army is going to come at the cost of spending lives. Yeah. And now it's abundantly clear. Yeah. So, like, if we did a casualty listing here. So, for the Battle of the Wilderness, the Union sustained 17,000 men killed, captured, wounded, or missing in two days. Uh, mm -hmm. That is less than their – that's about the same as their casualties at Chancellorsville a year prior, um, which actually a four, like a higher concentration of those casualties was in a lot shorter time period. But nevertheless, getting back on topic, 
The Confederates sustained about 11,000. So uh, a lot of people have said those are lopsided numbers. Uh, they're pretty similar to what we had at Chancellorsville, so it's not too much different. Um, if you looked at the top five bloodiest battles of the entire Civil War, uh, the Wilderness at 28,000 casualties comes in number five. Number four is Chancellorsville with about 30,000. So they beat them out by about 2,000 casualties. I think the other thing that – I think it's a mistake that people These make. These are costly, they, they too. I meant to say costly. It's not the bloodiest, but – Sure. Fair there. clarification, but I, I think the, uh, the 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 mistake that people are making when they do things like they seem to go, oh, that's kind of lopsided. Is they're missing the point? Is they're supposed to be lopsided because your federal army is in in the game with a, a vast amount of guys more recruits. Yeah, than your enemy. Yeah. So 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 seventeen thousand federals is exactly the same, if not you know. I don't know. I think maybe less than, you know, 11,000 Confederates. Well, 17,000. Lee goes from 60,000 men to 50,000 men. You know what I mean? Well, that's what I mean. 17,000 like, Federals can be replaced. Yeah. Like, Lee's now lost, a, you know, a tenth of his army or like a sixth of his army, and that's not going to be replaced very easily. Like, he'll get reinforced after Spotsylvania Courthouse, but his casualties are going to be way worse at that battle, and it's a lot less lopsided at Spotsylvania. Uh, and, and what's crazy is – it's just like, you know, the wilderness, this two day battle, there's a lot of heavy skirmishing on the seventh, but what's crazy is, and I'm going to paint this scene for you, Pat, because I cannot imagine a more epic scene that I would love to see in a, in a movie. So May 7th comes up, it's raining, uh, not hard, but it's heavy enough that it's starting to put out the fires. So there's a lot of billowing smoke sizzling. Uh, a lot of the embers and timbers, like got that post fire, look to it you know what i mean like you still see those like glowing embers and uh, a lot of the sparks kind of like the ash floating through the air it's smoky it's misty uh you know you got men being operated on in like field hospitals which are basically just tents in the middle of the woods wow. uh you got the wilderness tavern you got elwood that have been turned into these hospitals uh it's a cloudy gloomy day there's a lot of cavalry skirmishing going on down further south of you on the catharpin road around todd's tavern that's going to be the site of significant cavalry fighting on the day of the 7th. Um, and then, you know, and the Union headquarters, Grant, emerges from his tent. Uh, George Meade and both the staffs of the Army of the Potomac and Grant's personal staffs are waiting for him. And he basically says, all right, gentlemen, let's prepare to move. And they start to assemble. They start to get all their gear together. Uh, the, um, I believe it's the 5th Corps that starts moving out first. And... Um, they start – now, they're, they're basically saying, okay, if Grant turns left down the Orange Turnpike and starts heading east, that means we're heading to Fredericksburg. That means we're retreating. But if he stays straight and goes down the Brock Road, it means we're advancing. So Grant gets to these intersections, and he goes south. He starts going down the Brock Road, and everyone starts following him. And as the men in the lines, especially along the second corps, realize the direction that Grant's heading – they realize that for the first time in the history of the Army of the Potomac, after a battle in Virginia, the Army of the Potomac, the Union forces are advancing. And so massive cheers erupt. And these Union forces who may not have known Grant, who may not have known what to make of the battle for the last two days, see that all of that was worthwhile because here we are, we're advancing. We're not defeated. We've won. We've been victorious. We're going to keep going. So the yeah. emotions, those reactions – of these men, that's something that we need to look at. That's something that we need to take into consideration, especially in how we view this battle. It's not a abysmal ordeal. It's definitely horrific, and and it definitely doesn't sit well with a few men. Uh, but you know, these are the accounts that were used for years and years and years, and they're always the ones that badmouth Grant, that badmouth the war effort. Also, these guys all happen to be Democrats who also weren't abolitionists, and I think that's very interesting. Well, also, just also sit tight, buckle up. It's going to get a lot worse on this campaign. We're literally yeah. just getting started. Oh, yeah. But like, for, but imagine for these guys that after Gettysburg, this is the first major fight since. This well, that's the other thing I was going to say is I think that this is – yeah. I agree with you. Something that should be looked at and talked about and, and thought about, you know, deeply because what a moment this must have been because you got to yeah. imagine for at various times over the last day and a half for various men of the Army of the Potomac who've been around for a while, yeah. long yeah. enough to know that this is starting to look familiar. Yeah. They're all, and, and, you know, as, as 
people become in society when they're not in war, they can become very jaded. Guys yeah. who have been in the war for a long time generally, you know, have this sort of jaded mentality of like, it just is what it is or fatalist or whatever. And you got to yeah. imagine there's probably way more than one or two guys in the army of the Potomac who are figuring, we don't know this guy, but what's going to be so different about this guy that was different about Hooker, that was different about Burnside, that was different about McClellan, that was different about Pope, yeah. that was different about McClellan, you know? And, yeah. and yeah. then he gets to that intersection and he continues going. Yeah. And I think he, some of those guys probably just went, you know, it's, oh, um, <laughs> yeah, what's the, uh, I'm trying to think of the, uh, some movie was like, he just won a half a million dollars or whatever, but like, uh, it was some movie reference, but like, they weren't expecting it and they act no. like it didn't happen and then they're realizing it happened and there's probably, yeah, yeah there's probably some Union troops who are like, yeah, he, he went, of course Grant went down the, the Brock Road and then they're like, yeah, he went, he went down the Brock Road! Yeah. Woo! Yeah. They like, freak out, the you know? Thing is, these guys are so happy to just be getting out of these woods that that's like the biggest thing. That's so, a Tommy Boy reference I was thinking of. Tommy yeah. just sold half a million brake pads. Yep. Have like they million. can't believe it and then they believe it. Yeah. 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 Pretty much. God, it's um, getting late every on the show. Every old Tommy Boy on Mason. It's getting on late on history things yeah. with that, y'all. Yep. Now, here's what we also things uh, get muddled is that Lee, um, on his side of things, he's going to claim a victory. Uh, in his in his dispatches and all the Confederates believe that they've been victorious here as well. Um, but I'm like, what do you guys have to show for it? Not well, a lot. Um, and so they spend May 7th still skirmishing with the Union Army. But by the evening, Lee is going to realize um, that a lot of their camps are getting too close to these flames. So he's going to have Richard Anderson take over for Charles Field. He takes over the first corps for the wounded Long Street and is actually going to be a pretty capable commander. Anderson's going to move further down towards the Catharpin Road. Uh, and literally by the evening of May 7th, as Lee realizes Grant's army is moving out and they're moving south, uh, it doesn't take a genius to figure out where he's headed. That's Spotsylvania Courthouse. That's where the crossroads are. If Grant gets to Spotsylvania Courthouse, he'll be able to swing around, cut Lee off from the south and dig in defensively on the ground around Spotsylvania. Like it's, it's, it's a, it's a, we got to get there first is basically. So it becomes a race to Spotsy and Anderson already has a, a lead because he had moved out of uh, position. Um, but also um, on the eighth, on the morning of the eighth and the evening of the seventh, Jeb Stewart and Sheridan are going to be clashing all up along the Brock road, Catharpin road. And then eventually on the morning of the eighth, um, uh, Stewart's going to just delay Governor Warren's Fifth Corps advance, kind of a reverse of Gettysburg. And uh, the Confederate First Corps will reach Laurel Hill outside of Spotsylvania Courthouse literally 10 minutes before the Fifth Corps does of the Union Army. And that's where we'll end the story of the wilderness because it picks up with Spotsylvania Courthouse. That's another big difference is that unlike previous battles, these battles are going to pick up, are going to end and pick up exactly a day after that. There's yeah. not a lot of to breathe so in the context of how you would remember wilderness you're asking yourself how would these guys remember how can they like displace each of these battles and make something out of it it's like is the wilderness and spotsy considered one big battle to these guys because they're so close together and they happen in concert with one another is that the, the case with the north anna and cold harbor battles i mean one only knows but if you look at it individually the wilderness has so many moments that make it so important to the context of the Civil War. Uh, in context to it, I think it doesn't get the, the credit that it deserves. I think it needs more coverage. And I do think it's the D-Day. It's very bloody for the American forces, and American being the Union forces, but they advance. They get a foot on the, you know, they get a foot on the door and they go. And it's bloody, but they get there. And I mean, like, you know, look at Normandy. It wasn't really certain what was going on until like late july or early august that we yeah it was like more than 35 days after d-day where we yeah. finally were like that worked yeah so <laughs> the same thing and what's, what's great is eisenhower when he was preparing for normandy for when he was preparing for that campaign he was studying grant's overland campaign he was preparing himself for what grant had experienced these very formidable defensive fortifications obstacles how do you overcome them how do you keep moving what do we do how do you worry about the home front while worrying about what's happening on the battlefield like these things uh you know if grant's not the commander that uh you know if he's not this great commander that people would have you believe he's not then why is eisenhower studying him during one of the, one of the most impressive and important campaigns in world history i mean these are things that uh, this is honestly pat this is why i love the wilderness 
because Grant and Leeds are first time facing each other. And at the end of that battle, I would say these two men have a much larger respect for each other than they could have ever imagined. And they also grant um, that pivotal moment of going south, you know, regardless of what had just happened in those two days. I mean, they've achieved their tactical objective, even though the Lost Cause wouldn't have you believe it. Uh, you know, the North rejoices at this news, Lincoln especially. He kisses the guy that gives him the news that Grant's saying there's no turning back. We're going to Yeah, I mean, this is a powerful morale yeah. moment for the Army, for sure. Yep. Especially for the Army, yeah. The home front is going to reel at these losses. 17,000 casualties in two days. That's th Those are Gettysburg numbers. We don't like that anymore, you know? <laughs> like, we can't do that. But, like, uh, for these guys, for the Army of the Potomac to advance continuously, and it's going to sink in eventually that this is what we have to do. You know, we have to attack these guys. It's not fun. We don't have to like it, but we know it's necessary. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that correlation that begins to be – discovered at the wilderness and i mean it's just it's just such an interesting little battle to look at and that not little at all but like like i said it's the fifth costliest single battle of the war uh chancellorsville is number four spots of courthouse will be number three chickamauga is number two and gettysburg is one so i mean wilderness is on the board it's in the top five i mean yeah. it's something that we got to remember and those fires make it definitely the scariest most terrifying battle that these guys will fight i think because of those fires, because of the horrendous conditions, because of this big, deep, dark forest that they fight in in such a different manner than what they fought at Chancellorsville, this fight will stick with these guys above all the other ones that they fight. Because there's right. going to be something horrific about every battle. But, yeah, the wilderness has the fire. And it it's has a little more of an exceptional characteristic. To but it. a couple things stuck out to me as you were sort of ramping up there. One was uh, when you mentioned that Lee had claimed – the actions as sort of a victory for his guys and himself. It, mm -hmm. it immediately reminded me of, uh, a, I'm working on another project um, by doing the biography and sort of war, first world war narrative of a soldier, of the Canadian expeditionary force. And so right now I'm going through all these original records and I, I, I came across a book, um, uh, an original record in, in, of the Battle of Vimy Ridge, and yeah. some, it's got some German perspectives, and it's got one of Eric Ludendorff's yeah. uh, after action reports writing back to the Kaiser, letting him know that Vimy Ridge was an overwhelmingly huge success for the German army. <laughs> and I'm like, here. Yep. I'm like, no, not at all. But, and then the other, you know, because one thing that happens a lot, and it seems to be happening a lot more lately than it ever used to, because it used to just seem to revolve around the trenches at Petersburg. Was yeah. the, the Civil War and the, and the First World War, the Great War, um, World War One, are all they're getting compared a lot more, and um, you know we've done it a few times on the show today. And one of the other things that I was thinking of was, and I kind of chuckled about it because it reminded me of uh, Dan Carlin, a uh, Hardcore History episode where they're you know having a theoretical conversation, two British soldiers fighting in these linear sequential style battles, like wilderness and Spotsylvania that kind of all roll and they're trying to figure out if they were at the battle of the Marne or not you know <laughs> like yeah. this is like uh, that reminded me was like because this is what we're doing here is basically from here to the end we're fighting in these uh, they sure they get their own individual names yeah. together but this is essentially one long running moving fight through the Rappahannock region and yeah. and just to sort of wrap up you know for our listeners here is from here until Petersburg uh, which is going to begin just a few months later, right at the end of the summer of 64 here. What we have is, is Grant engaging in a fight, and when the initiative is lost, things don't go his way, or it suits him or whatever, Grant's going to do, like we were just said here at the Wilderness, he's going to do what, what other Union commanders haven't done, and that's what will happen. He does it here at the Wilderness, and he'll do it again here at Spotsylvania Courthouse uh, in the following weeks. And what that is is he'll engage the enemy, he'll engage in a fight, and when something changes, whatever needs to happen to maintain the status quo, the bottom line of just winning the war, destroying the yeah. Confederate army is, he'll do it. And so what that amounts to is he engages until it no longer suits him to engage. Then he disengages, moves to the left, moves to the right, and just keeps in advancing forward. And that yeah. what that ends up doing, guys, is that puts Lee in a really tough um, borderline impossible position to be in, right? So what are 
what are, what's good. happening yeah. is, is yeah. Grant is marching on Richmond, but Richmond isn't really the objective. The objective you know, is just he's to gonna have to fight him. Like, he's just keep. He, he's just essentially stringing Lee along to keep making sure Lee can't do anything other than fight him and de deploy, yeah. deplete his forces. So, so Lee's choices are to do what? He can either let Grant go because he knows this is coming, right? Like Lee knows between his own brain and his own long street telling him and the other reconnaissance he's getting, you don't have the numbers, you don't have the reinforcements, you don't have the supplies, resources, like Grant literally can just keep this going until your army is nothing. So he knows yeah. this. So, so Lee's choices are very simple. You can let Grant go so that none of that affects you. You can retreat somewhere to like the Valley, the Shenandoah Valley yeah. and create a new style of war from there. But, symbolically that's going to crush the hopes of your cause of independence right if falls, right yeah. if richmond falls even though richmond means nothing it really um, is. and the other like, the other option lee has and the one he ends up taking is to fight grant knowing that it's just going to result in the degradation of his forces to a nothingness and and the war will be over anyway so i think right now may and if he doesn't know it on May 7th or May 8th, 1864, when Spotsylvania yeah. Courthouse wraps up on May 21st, yeah. Lee knows this war is already over. Yep. Like 100%. It doesn't matter. He cannot, he, his, it, last hope, his last hope is that election of 1864. Just correct. like anybody else. It's Jeff Davis's last hope. It's Lee's last hope. They know that literally. Militar so let me, let me rephrase yeah. and be clear. Militarily, he knows this war is over. Yeah. And, and for anybody That's who makes the case that him. there's that there's no way he could have known it, guys, if you're making the case that in one breath Lee couldn't have known this and the war isn't over and they still had this, but you're also making the argument that Lee is this friggin' battlefield genius from 62 to 63, like the legend has propped him up to be or whatever, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. Like if <laughs> Lee is a genius, he is aware right now that this is the situation he's in and he yeah. knows it's over. Um which is why he's sort of ready to take the army for a moment and leave. Uh, or, or I guess not really, which is why I guess the guys around him rather are ready yeah. to start taking the army and leaving. And while he's trying to buckle down and defend Richmond, they're like trying to start, you're the yeah. Confederacy. Uber Early never even makes it to Richmond. He's going to take the second corps out to the Valley and then up to Monoxy. So like, yeah, it's, it, it definitely, you do see that dis that kind of disconnect there. And I mean, it's, it's a really bloody fight here. If, I mean, if we look at the Overland campaign, yeah. it starts on roughly May 2nd, officially May 2nd, and goes till about June 18th when they get outside Petersburg. And those, between those two dates, both these armies were going to accrue between 83 to 88,000 men killed, captured, wounded, or missing in yeah. literally almost just two months' time. Yeah. For the month of May alone, that means just for the battles of the wilderness that we just talked about and the Spotsylvania Courthouse 13-day battle that's going to occur, single longest individual battle of the war, um, you're going to have about 36,000 Union soldiers killed, captured, wounded, or missing in these two battles, and then 24,000 Confederates killed, captured, wounded, or missing. So, like, if you put those numbers together, <laughs> that's nearly 60,000 casualties in just the month of May alone. So that, yeah. of that number, first of all, what that does is it puts North Anna and Cold Harbor in a much lighter perspective being like, everyone says Cold Harbor is the worst part of the, the campaign. Uh-uh. That's mm -hmm. Boston Courthouse and then the wilderness. Um, yeah, the start of it is definitely the, the worst part. Um, sure. But yeah, and just the fighting that happens in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. This, this, this is a very bloody, very horrific style of combat. But honestly, that's what we're fighting through in World War II. So like I've told many people, Grant's ahead of the curve. He really is. I mean, there's yep. no other way at it he is accepting warfare in a new light a light that we're all going to have to accept when we look at world war one when we look at world war two and like just these mass casualties every single day to accomplish these strategic and tactical objectives we have to be ready to lose people because that's the best way the attrition is just the name of the game i mean it, it really is when you're looking at this war but i mean People can argue with that all they want. They can disregard the facts. They can make their own assessments. I can't control that. But one thing you have to take away from is Grant is victorious here, and not just out of luck, not just out of his sheer numbers, but because he 
stood toe to toe with Lee here at the wilderness and decided I'm going to beat you. And this is how I'm going to do it. And we go from there and it's why the wilderness is so important, which is why it's my favorite battle to look at. Cause I do love general grant and I do like looking at his first meeting with Robert E. Lee as a success. I mean, maybe not a decisive victory. Like, I mean, I know people are going to disagree with me on that. That's fine. Um, Like I said, it's a controversial point, but I look at Grant Meade at the wilderness as a success because I mean, they don't advance if it's not a success. It's simple as that. And then we have to give the credit to them where it is earned. And that's my final point on that. Well, every other man, dude, I appreciate you coming by here. Uh, you know, we, we sort of did this on the fly just because, you know, the, the, the current COVID-19 quarantine that we're all living through is, is, is allowing uh, a lot of us to sort of pursue things that, you know, we, you know, haven't done otherwise with all this extra time uh, we're getting. It. And I haven't touched on a lot of these yeah. Rappahannock region battles other than, you know, more or less Fredericksburg. So, uh, you know, I, I really – you know, wanted to cover the wilderness for a long time, but this is a story that I, I'll be very honest with you. Like I'm not super versed in, which is why tonight you guys heard a lot from Avery. And I, and I asked a little bit of questions here and there. It's like, cause I know this story uh, well enough to have a conversation with, with a lot of people, but like, if, I'm, if we're really going to tell it here, we got to tell it right. And to tell it right, we got to talk to experts and people who are passionate about it. And you were far and away, both of those things. So I really, you know, I, I appreciate you, you coming on, on my show and, and, and talking with everyone here about it. Um, before we get out of here, a couple things about Avery, guys. He is the host of Battles and Banter podcast, uh, which, like mine and Match of the History Things podcast, can be found wherever podcasts uh, are downloaded. They are... Spotify. They, yeah, get that Spotify and iTunes going. They are one of the awesome, young, up-and-coming uh, uh, podcasts out there. Oh, they were a huge inspiration for our own show. Um, uh, him... Cody and Tony, uh, funny guys, really insightful, well-read guys. So not only are you getting like, you know, really good, you know, analysis, but you're getting it in really fun ways and things like that, which is why Battles and Banter, by the way, is the best title for your show ever. On Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, We do appreciate it if you find us on iTunes and give us a cool review. Uh, Definitely is appreciated. Um, We are also going to do our own wilderness battle. So it was really interesting that you brought me on tonight to do this. Um, I think in the next week or two, I'm going to have a pretty big group of people. We're going to do our wilderness episode. And it's really just going to be, you know, one big discussion of the battle rather than just me spewing information on <laughs> it's, it, it's going to be a banter. So I uh, look yeah, forward to that You episode. guys got to download yep. that episode. That's probably going to be fantastic. Put, just, uh, we just put our last of our remastered uh, rebooted remade series up that was a series of our first episodes that uh, we ended up deleting and redoing due to its poor audio quality uh, we just put our last one up today uh, it's the battle of Idrain valley as seen in the movie we were soldiers about vietnam um, and i uh, highly recommend it you get to hear me eat tacos and uh, we come up with <laughs> and burns uh, he's now kenjamin burns to us affectionately <laughs> and uh, yeah, and uh, we also have a new podcast idea called Cardigans and Chit Chat. So, <laughs> yeah, you guys have a great time on your show. I had a lot yeah. of fun, it's uh, a fun being, time. being a it's guest a on your fun. show a couple times, and uh, I hope you had as much fun as a guest on our show because uh, oh, I dude. certainly yeah. crack up when I come out and, uh, and I'm on battles and banter. Um, so, so we'll we'll leave it on this note, right? Um, yeah. You know, uh, Avery is is an amazing storyteller. He's going to appear on History Things with Pat. He's going to appear on History Things podcast. Uh, and I can't encourage you guys enough uh, to follow what he's doing and, and be supportive. Um, he's the man. He's got these stunning new blue shade glasses that I, I've been tripping out at for like the last two and a half hours. Because as I you feel like closer, I, I got the glare now. I feel like, yeah, I feel like Ian Malcolm, honestly. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're also very stunning with them. So yeah. uh, what I will, uh, <laughs> was that a Jurassic Park <laughs> reference that you yeah, made? Dude. Yeah, you're the man. Yeah, um, okay, also, they, it's the only movie in the world where Samuel Jackson doesn't curse unnecessarily. I like, mean, hold he wanted, on to your butts. Hold on to your butts. It's, yeah, it's my that's my life motto, honestly. There's no F word in there, huh, Sam Jackson? No. Oh, he wanted. Uh, so it's, oh. it's all good. So uh, we are covering uh, Chancellorsville uh, uh, on the page right now. Uh, so that's you guys. By the time this is posting, you should be seeing the wrap up posts. Uh, you can obviously go back and look at those. Um, and then make sure uh, that you tune into the History Things podcast uh, two times now coming up soon. Right now you can tune in 
on um, iTunes, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, uh, and by asking your Amazon Alexa app to play the History Things podcast uh, to listen to Avery's uh, Battle of Fredericksburg episode, it is an almost four-hour monster. <laughs> Uh, it was so much fun. If you think that uh, this was a, a, a casual deep dive, this this Fredericksburg episode is probably uh, uh, not even because it's not even because it's like my show and my show. It's just I had I was kind of fanboying out listening to you talk about it. I think it's one of the best approaches to the to the battle I've ever heard. And then we're gonna have you back uh, in a couple days to record the follow up episode because we've yep. had a ton of really great uh, listener questions for you. Uh, so we want to get you back. We'll clarify some things. We'll ask, answer some listener questions and stuff. So, uh, so we'll sign off here with history things with Pat by saying thank you so much, Avery, for coming out. Um, uh, everybody out there, uh, keep your heads up. I love you guys. Thank you so much for supporting. Yeah, thank uh, you. History things with Pat, Battles of Banter podcast, uh, the History Things podcast itself. Uh, until we see you again, everybody, take care. See you soon. See you guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>